to introduce our speaker, who is Professor uh, Tomasz Koncewicz from, originally from the University of Gdansk, but uh, at the same time from many places, including University of Princeton and, and also uh, uh, a frequent visitor of EUI as broader fellow and in other capacities and an old friend of mine. And let me, let me use this opportunity also to introduce someone in the room who just arrived and, and will be with us. Uh, maybe also uh, can serve with, with uh, uh, certain legal court cases against him, uh, Professor Wojciech Sadurski from the University of Sydney. And he has about four, four cases, Wojciech, against him both criminal and, and civil cases, uh, defamation cases uh, introduced by the Polish government, the previous one, or the, the just outgoing one, I would say, uh, and also by the very, very government loyal uh, state media uh, company and many others. So if there will be an interest I know because I already experienced this, he can, can talk about those procedures for hours. Uh, but now the floor is, is yours, Tomek. Uh, thank you, Gabor. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Very, thank you very much for your uh, kind words of uh, introduction. And I, I can assure you that uh, participating in your uh, doctoral seminars uh, always counted as the highlights of my academic career. So it's great to be back uh, in Florence. So. What I, what I want to do today is to go beyond the nitty gritty of the rule of law. Uh, it won't be a technical discussion of what the raw rule of law is, what kind of components should be part of the, of the rule of law. Rather, I want to ask a more axiological, more ethical question of uh, what it means to be a lawyer who wants to defend the rule of law. Uh, so, it goes beyond the technical aspect because one of the crucial distinctions that I will, I will make throughout my presentation, and that goes back to uh, what my dear friend, Professor Miroslav Wyszykowski, uh, former judge of the Polish Constitutional Court said, it takes a lawyer to rebuild the rule of law. It takes a law graduate to destroy the rule of law. And I think this distinction will be crucial because we make... Uh, 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 all too uh, quick, a, we, 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 don't make, we don't make this distinction uh, uh, clear enough. And when we say lawyers, we kind of uh, include everybody who has a uh, law diploma. And that's not that, uh, that, that easy. So first part of my presentation will be about framing. I will contextualize my uh, my. Uh, my presentation and my argument. Then I will explain how the world we, the lawyers, live uh, uh, change and how this change keeps challenging our understanding of what it means uh, to be a lawyer. Uh, and finally, I will uh, ask the question about uh, how to move forward with our uh, legal uh, profession in order to be up to the challenge of uh, changing uh, times. Uh, and finally, I will go back to my initial uh, uh, point of becoming a lawyer. And for me, becoming a lawyer will be a combination of three factors, rights, duties, and also uh, lessons. So first of all, uh, two caveats are very important. You do, you do not become a lawyer when you get a law diploma. You become a law graduate. If you want to become a lawyer, it is a process of doing the good things and saying the right things and speaking up when the time keeps calling on you. So becoming a lawyer is a process. Uh, graduating from the law school is but a starting point for a very grueling journey of becoming a lawyer. And then my second caveat is become, becoming of the rule of law. Uh, my emphasis in the presentation today is not about the check boxes. What what makes the rule of law, but my, my main concern is why the rule of law, what the rule of law is supposed to do for us 
And once you have this question out of the way, then you can fill out the rule of law with a more normative uh, content. First of all, you have to know why the rule of law in the first place, and then you can go about uh, the content of the, of, of the concept. So what are the changing paradigms? Uh, first of all, the, today, the goals of autocracy are achieved without its usual ta telltale signs. And it goes back to the argument of uh, uh, Kim Lane Shepela, who, who said that today we no, we no longer have tanks in the streets. Rather, we have smart graduates of law who hide under the legalistic cover and form. They will use the law against the law to hollow out the liberal content of the legal uh, order. And I think it keeps challenging our understanding of, uh, 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 of our profession. Because in the past, the, st the distinction was pretty straightforward. The Democrats were, for, were in favor of uh, 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 democracy and constitutionalism, and the autocrats were against both. Right now, uh, the picture is more, is more hazy, is more, uh, more nuanced, uh, because uh, uh, those hollowing out the liberal content of our uh, normative, of our legal orders, are claiming to be Democrats. They are hiding under the uh, democratic mandate using a brute majority to destroy the liberal foundations of, uh, of, the, of the legal order. And at the end, they claim everything's fine because we are acting on the basis of a democratic mandate. So what's, what's the big deal? And I think it keeps challenging our uh, uh, lawyer's imagination of how we think about who we are, uh, who we are as uh, lawyers. So becoming a, law a lawyer, uh, right now with the question mark five elements i do not answer uh, authoritatively at this point what it means to be a lawyer i simply ask a question uh, and open space for discussion you might you might become a lawyer if you say no to cheating by way of legalistic schemes and meanings second you might become a lawyer if you say no to instrumentalization you might become a lawyer if you say no to cynicism. You might become a lawyer if you leave nobody behind. And you might become a lawyer if you speak up for the dignity of the legal uh, uh, profession and for all the victims of the oppressive regime. So it's a potentiality. You might become a lawyer if you do all those things. If you have the courage to speak up, to behave, in a decent manner, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the question mark. It explains why I put the question mark. So secondly, uh, if you want to uh, know what kind of a lawyer you are, you have to know what is the narrative that you live by? What, what is your story? What is your story as a, uh, as, as a lawyer? And I, and I build the narrative for a lawyer who's challenged by the changing paradigms of uh, uh, autocratic legalism around five elements. First of all, uh, if you look from, from this more, uh, more bird's eye view at what has happened in, in Poland and before in Hungary, uh, you try to move beyond here and now and you try to understand why it is so important for us to think of Polish and Hungarian case in more axiological terms. And once you start uh, uh, figuring out, figuring out how to frame your uh, vocation as a lawyer in more axiological terms, then you give yourself a chance to become a lawyer. So first of all, there is a principle of principles within the uh, European public space. We supposedly have learned from the past. Political power was supposed to be constrained from the outside. Every political power was supposed to be a power constrained by law. Commonality of values that bind us Europeans together and the challenge of finding the right fit between on the one hand, the trust, we believe in the common values, article two of the treaty on the European Union, while at the same time, we remember what has happened and what kind of atrocities were committed by the nation states in the name of the people. So there is an element of distrust at the same time. Uh, fourthly, uh, a lawyer believes that democracy will be rebuilt through law. Law, not war. And this sentiment of uh, trusting the law was, was uh, 
relived and revisited in 1989 when the new democracies emerged from the shadow of the commun uh, 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 Soviet, uh, Soviet regime. We also, in my part of Europe, we believed in the power of the law that protects, that liberates. And finally, Europe and never again constitutionalism. This is absolutely crucial for understanding the vocation of lawyers today, because if you want to become a lawyer, you should understand that the constitution was supposed to be the supreme law of the land, that fundamental rights were supposed to set out the limits of for, for the political uh, power and for the power political power's interference into uh, 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 individual autonomy, separation of powers and checks and balances, and finally, supranational adjudication. Those are five elements that define the narrative of my understanding of uh, what it means to become, to become a lawyer. Uh, so that was framing. And that is not, that, let, let us now move to a uh, second part, explaining. Because if you have the narrative that you as a lawyer want to defend in your daily actions, you have to understand the counterframe. What challenges your understanding of what, what it means to, to be a lawyer? And what happens when your strive to become a lawyer faces the world of a law graduate? And the world of a law graduate that is somebody armed with a diploma who is ready to serve the political masters is completely different from my world of a lawyer. So what, 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 what are the elements of this uh, world of a law graduate? First of all, a law graduate under, understands the role of the constitution as not as a document to protect uh, the individual rights of the people, of the citizens, but rather simply to, pro to protect the existence and uniqueness of the state. And we have saw this in a painful way in Poland and before that in Hungary. The law equals the will of the majority. Rule of law, one of the paradigms of the transformation of 1989, rule of law for the law graduate who serves his political masters, no longer frames the, the, the decision-making process. Rather, it simply facilitates the expression of the will of the people. So rule of law, rule of law does not frame the decision-making process, does not constrain the decision-making process, because rule of law might be thrown out the window if so demands the will of the people. Uh, 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 fourth element, law as such has no independent standing it is understood as the outcome of political action. And if you look at the Polish case, this is exactly what has happened with all those uh, so-called reforms of the Polish uh, 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 judiciary. Whatever comes out of parliament becomes law, no matter what the content of this legislation is. Constitution is no longer a higher law. And finally, again, one of the paradigms of the uh, post 19, uh, 1989 transformation, constitutional court that was supposed to serve as a check on the political majority is becoming an enabler of the political power. Simply rubber stamping whatever comes out of, uh, out of uh, the political uh, uh, process. And what is the name of the law, law's graduate best friend? Constitutional capture. If you have the counter frame, you need a tool to realize all those uh, tenets of the of the of the counterframe, and constitutional capture delivers on, of, on the promise that the law graduate makes to its political masters. You take one institution after another until there is no pocket of independence within the uh, legal system of a uh, uh, state. So. My third part of, uh, uh, of the argument is the most important uh, and also uh, important for personal reasons, which I will uh, explain in a, in, in a second. Because lawyers and the rule of law, yes, rule of law is our business. But in order to defend the rule of law, we, the lawyers, have to move beyond the lawyers' heads and we have to embrace the social function of lawyers as citizens. So. Are lawyers 
lawyers lost in capture or have we been given a chance to kind of revisit who we are and what we uh, what we do first of all if we want to answer this question in the affirmative when it comes to the second part of, of the question are we reborn in the rebuild of the rule of law we have to face the paradigm change and adapt our language we have been trained for spotting the wrong signs of danger mass violations of human rights etc cetera, etc cetera. no there will be no mass violations of human rights. There will be no massive, uh, uh, there will be no tanks in the streets. No, the constitutional capture will proceed step by step incrementally using all the legal techniques that are available, adding an element of uh, bad faith. And at the end, you will end up with the captured state. Secondly, lawyers have to learn how to track in detail how the legal autocracy uh, works. We have to recognize the new signs of danger, and we have to understand that the shell of liberal constitutionalism might be preserved, but the liberal core is being hollowed out. We might look at the Polish constitutional court, and we might say, wow, the court is still there. It's even in the same building. But what is missing? The liberal heart of the institution is gone, has been ripped out. Because functionally speaking, this body that stays in the same building is no longer a constitutional court from the functional uh, uh, perspective because it does not protect the constitution. Fourthly, we have to learn how to document the unconstitutional change and learn from it, not repeat the same mistakes of uh, naivete. It will never happen again here. No, 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 it will happen here if we don't change and if we don't adapt. We have to be a generalist and understand how different constitutional features interact. I remember to this very day when I was uh, in Berkeley in December 2015, and when I saw what's going on with the Polish Constitutional Court in December 2015, I knew that the counter-revolution has just started because once the court falls down, the domino effect will follow and all the other institutions will follow uh, a constitutional court. So we have to understand how destroying the judicial review will affect the entire legal system. And we lawyers at that time, we didn't appreciate the danger that was, uh, that, that was, that was coming. And finally, we have to mobilize and coordinate resistance and educate the citizenry. So this final, this final uh, point, Take, takes me to uh, a concept that is uh, underdeveloped in Europe still uh, and very, very uh, popular and uh, influential uh, on the other side of, of, of the ocean uh, in America and in Canada. It's called the legal complex. Legal complex tells you that courts must never be left alone. Why? Because legal complex is composed of all the representatives of legal occupations, professionals, advocates, attorneys, legal advisors, uh, academics that support, that build the supportive structure for the courts when they are attacked. And it is important to understand why legal complex, why this coordinating effort among the legal practitioners and the academics is so crucial. First of all, if we are together, we are, we, are, we are giving ourselves a much better chance to create a common knowledge that a violation has occurred. As a legal profession, not separately, attorneys, judges, academics, we have to work in tandem together. We have, as part of the legal complex, we have a much better chance to mobilize and coordinate the public opinion and resistance if we speak with one voice. We have to defend the constitutional essentials as a legal profession. And we have to frame the issues in terms of the constitutional fidelity. The constitution sets out the parameters of our belonging and defines us as citizens. And if we work together as part of the legal complex, we have a good chance to bring about the change on the ground. 
But this change on the ground will be uh, achieved only if we look at the legal complex as a legal profession from three different uh, perspectives. Uh, first of all, that's what we do. That's a very traditional understanding of the legal complex. We have to frame the arguments and we have to bring the cases before courts. That's what we do. We are lawyers and that's our business to go to courts, to plead, to plead uh, cases and try convince, try convince the court uh, to intervene uh, in order to bring about, uh, bring about the change. But this first perspective, it's, it's not enough because rule of law works in a society. It's not a rule of law and society, it's a rule of law in a society because legal complex is a social phenomenon. It, it only works as part of the societal, societal fabric. And this is where the challenge is for the lawyers to actually move the legal complex downstream and to build the fidelity among the citizenry for the rule of law by explaining, educating, mobilizing, coordinating the effort, et cetera, et cetera. That's the second dimension. The third, the third uh, dimension is about radiating the, the, the rule of law beyond the courtroom and beyond the legal profession. The question here is how the rule of law operates beyond the courtroom. We belong to the constitutional order and this belonging entails a commitment to the order's essentials. Because if we don't protect the constitutional essentials beyond the courtroom, then the constitution will be a piece of paper. So going beyond lawyers' heads, that delivers on the third aspect of the, of the legal complex. We have learned from the Polish example that institutions that are not embedded into the society, when, when the third element of the legal complex is missing, those institutions will fall one by one because it is only through social legitimacy of the institutions that those institutions will be protected against the future attempts of uh, 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 capture. So this, this element of moving beyond the institutions and embracing the challenge of embedding the constitutional uh, essentials within the society is absolutely, is absolutely uh, uh, crucial. So becoming a lawyer of rights, duties, and lessons, I only have uh, two minutes left. So first of all, of rights, and this part is very simple, but the most important because I will simply read aloud uh, what I uh, uh, have uh, uh, put together uh, preparing for this presentation. What are the rights that make you a lawyer? First, you have, you have a right to ask a question, what has happened? You have a right to ask a question, what have you done? You have a right to ask a question, where have you been when the, when the constitutional capture proceeded? You have a right not to shake their hands, the law graduates responsible for the constitutional capture. You have a right not to sh shake their hands, to stigmatize them. You have a right finally to speak about the dignity of the legal profession. So that's the rights uh, aspect of our uh, becoming of a lawyer, of duties. You have a duty to be better than your enemies. You have a duty not to leave people alone and to speak in the name of those who have been oppressed by the regime. You have a duty not to be indifferent. And what are the lessons finally? Understand the signs become, be, before they become poisonous pills destroying the system from within. Know your enemy and its methods. Leave a trace of decency. I truly believe that what we do, how we behave and what we say matters in the long term because symbolism in the times of oppression matters beyond here and now. And let me, let me finish on, on a very personal note. Uh, on 15th October, uh, when the results of the elections were uh, pronounced, I sat in my apartment in, in, in Gdynia and I had a short moment of satisfaction because over the course of, la of those eight years that were very difficult personally for me, I told myself, you never gave in. You never succumbed. You never choose the shortcut, even though you were, you were offered some shortcuts. 
you never betrayed who you are. And I think if you want to create a good change from the ground up, you, me, you have to start from here because good change starts in your heart and it radiates behind, beyond your heart. It starts how you talk to the members of your most immediate community, to your neighbors, how you spread the message, how you explain to your friends, to your colleagues, to who, whoever you interact uh, with, what has happened and what is the way forward. So my personal five nevers, Gabor, it will be very quick. Never allow the limitations and the calculations of others to become your own. Never accept business as usual. Never accept the view, no, that can be done. Never compromise when fundamentals come into play. Never look the other way when injustice happens. If we have those five elements internalized, good things will happen. And finally, two weeks ago, I reminded myself uh, of an interview that I gave together with former president of the Supreme Court, uh, Mr. Adams Czembosz, who is who is an icon figure in in, in Poland. Uh, who, he was he was the first president of the Supreme Court after uh, 1989. And the title of the interview that we gave to Judge Pospolita, which is the leading daily in Poland, was "It pays off to be decent," because that was the lesson of the history. If you don't know how to behave, behave decently. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tomek. Uh, actually, we do not foresee any Q&A after this session, but I realize that there are so, so emotional and so... Sorry, I don't understand. This is... <laughs> Emotions are difficult to be understood. I, I hope you understand. So, <laughs> even Siri does not. Uh, so... <clears throat> So challenging and, and emotional speech uh, maybe needs some, some reactions. Uh, so I, I will, will give the floor for up to 10 minutes uh, uh, reactions. Uh, if I may put my first reaction is that, of course, uh, the judges uh, in, in the EU member states uh, entering the EU did not expect to be uh, moral freedom fighters. Uh, unfortunately, in some member states, this, this happened to be the case that sometimes being decent is not, not necessarily enough uh, to, to fight. But this is not a profession for fighting, but still. So these are the, the issues I would like to raise. I saw first Professor Grimm and from here also someone. Okay, so Professor Grimm. Uh, I must confess that I enjoyed it all very much. And that uh, uh, I basically agree with what you said, but I would like to make one remark. I think it is, uh, difficult, if not problematic, to speak uh, about the rule of law without uh, speaking about democracy and vice versa. It's impossible to speak about democracy without speaking about the rule of law. Uh, and the reason uh, for this, I think, is that, of course, the rule of law presupposes laws, but not any laws, not any kind of laws, but laws that serve the needs of society and its components, its individuals best. And this requirement is not fulfilled by the rule of law, but is fulfilled by democracy. But because without democracy, you don't have inclusiveness of all people who are affected and you don't have participation of all. So pursued in an isolated way, rule of law or democracy, pursued in an isolated way, I think they tend to self-destruction and this has to be avoided. Thank you so much. Uh, very short comment and one question. First of all, thank you for your wonderful and very powerful speech. It is extremely inspiring for me, especially uh, since I was at the court at the beginning of the crisis, then I was uh, forced to leave the court. And uh, as an assistant of one of the judges, 
uh, I have to admit that I have completely different perception and point of view than you presented. So it was extremely inspiring for me. But I have a question. If a becoming a lawyer is a process, as you suggested, uh, do you believe that this is the one way uh, ticket towards the, uh, I don't know, um, a very uh, liberal uh, uh, and a very liberal uh, end. Uh, are you suggesting that the super conservative judges, for instance, who do not necessarily share all those your presuppositions uh, are in the beginning of the process or they cannot become a lawyer? Because I'm wondering whether your concept is uh, pluralistic and liberal or rather constitutionally religious. Thank you, Tomek. That was a very inspiring speech. Um, this uh, saying that it pays off to be decent is actually uh, borrowed from one of my favorite uh, um, authorities in Poland. That's uh, Professor Bartoszewski, who's obviously already not, not with us um, on this earth. And I think you're completely right in that, that uh, in order to be a lawyer, that is, um, it's, it's a question of moral decency. But I also wanted to actually, um, um, Professor Grimm uh, raised this issue. I wanted to say that we, I think it's important to speak about rule of law um, together with democracy, because otherwise you can have rule by law, which is very easily confused and can generate extremely destructive laws, as we've seen in history, uh, modern history, that has been far worse than the destruction of judiciary. Um, it, was, it was genocide, other things, by law, and that was by parliament. So I think this distinction can, well, can be well encapsulated when it is brought together with the concept of democracy as the foundation. Um, so I would also in that include what also, I'm kind of repeating what you're saying, but um, I know that your speech was about uh, the role of lawyers but many of the lawyers who, let's say, stood down from being judges or stood down from um, being defense lawyers or were actually disciplinary, like thrown out, um, they became part of civil society, part of, I think, what was an extremely huge force that led to the result that it is we have in Poland today. Um, and that participation is also part of democracy. Um, and I would, yeah, I would think that this is part of the discussion where, you know, we can talk as lawyers amongst lawyers about laws, but we can't forget the force of people who actually, you said that you were in, I don't know, Princeton or somewhere, um, when you heard about what happened uh, in the constitutional court? Yeah, so the fake judges being being um, nominated by the president overnight, in the stead of those that had been properly nominated um, by the the government, the parliament. I think a lot of people understood at that point what was happening. In fact, the first I remember watching uh, from Italy um, the court case of the still then um, constitutional court who gave a decision. And I remember that saying that this was not legal. These nominations were not legal. And there was a huge demonstration outside and there was a huge counter of how many days, because as you know, in Polish constitutional law as in many others, you need to publish the decision, right? They didn't publish it because they didn't want to publish it because they wanted the Yudu suspectors to be in, in the constitutional court. So I think there was an awareness of the fact that this is not a good sign because there was complete, uh, yeah, completely disregard for the constitutional decision that came very quickly and was one of the first ones that was televised and was very well watched, um, at least 
as far as I know. So thank you very much, though, for a very inspiring um, speech. I think you had many excellent points in there. And yeah, that's it. If we look for the silver lining over what has happened in Poland, there is one. We never had before 2015 the kind of constitutional conversation that we are having right now. Judges see themselves as engaged citizens that are called upon as judges to apply the constitution to actually defend the fundamental rights. So law works not only as a uh, sword to punish, but it works as, also as a shield. And that's the first step towards building the social legitimacy of the judiciary when you actually have a court that is ready to protect you. And trust me, I'm speaking from experience of uh, 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 going to various seminars for, for the judges uh, before 2015. And the constitution was a point not discussed. They were, they were simply not willing to take up my argument when I tried to tell them, listen, you have three constitutions right now, Convention on Human Rights, Polish Constitution, and our domestic constitutional document. So try to reconcile the three. And they were looking at me uh, 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 in disbelief. What? Constitution should be applied? It, it has direct effect? No way, Professor Koncevich. It is just a document. And right now we are, we are having this conversation that actually con constitution matters. Constitution is for something, it's, it's to protect. So, uh, so I want to build on this moving forward. Uh, 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 question uh, about uh, um, uh, Michał, uh, it's, a very, it's a very good point and trust me, I am uh, not a religious fundamentalist, not at all. My assumption on how I frame the discussion of becoming a lawyer is based on a very simple uh, 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 thesis. If you want to become a lawyer, if you want to become a lawyer citizen, you have to accept that you operate within a given uh, axiological structure that is set, set out by the constitutional document. Constitution sets out a framework. We might differ and we will differ within the framework, but we never go against the framework. So uh, 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 Professor Sadurski's wonderful argument uh, we, with which I completely uh, agree that this constitutional court, even though there are legally appointed judges on this constitutional court, has no place in the Polish legal system. Why? Because those judges who were legally appointed, they were deciding cases in clear violation of a constitutional text in bad faith. So even though they were legally appointed, they are not lawyers for me because they overstep the framework that is set out by the constitution. Constitution sets out a framework of shared values within which we might differ, we might argue our differences out, but never ever we reject this constitutional framework of reference. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, I, think, I think it is really important to understand that uh, Poland and Polish rule of law has been given another chance with the elections. But there's no going back to what Polish rule of law looked like uh, before 2015. We have to work hard, we lawyers, we have to engage citizenry, we have to work hard to embed the rule of law. Because rule of law will be only strengthened and will survive if it operates within this precious space that is provided by the habits of heart. And trust me, building habits of heart takes much longer than building another set of allegedly perfect uh, uh, institutions. That will not do the trick this time. Uh, thank you very much. And my, my closing, it's not closing, just, just the last word. Uh, I, I very much understand what what is going on in 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 Poland because it has been going on even even longer in my home country Hungary. I very much hope that those kind of of concerns won't uh, really touch uh, uh, happier member states and judges in those states. But I'm afraid that if the virus is, is spreading all over the, the, the EU, this might happen. 
So take it as a warning and, and be, be happy if you do not experience such an issue of, of your wonderful profession as a, as a judge or lawyer. Thank you very much. So welcome back. And uh, let me introduce the two panelists of, of this uh, next one and a half hours discussion, uh, the theme of which is, is uh, the primacy of EU law versus the primacy of national constitutions. So this is a this is a a question uh, which actually, as opposed to the question we we discussed on 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 judicial independence, it actually applies to almost all the member states uh, in different ways, of course, but certainly it has been raised ever since uh, uh, some decisions of the, of the uh, uh, German constitutional court going back to the 70s, the Zolange decision, the first Zolange decision of the German constitutional court is from 1974, and the second one is 1986. Uh, this raised the question how much uh, constitutional courts uh, accept the absolute primacy of, of EU law in their uh, jurisdiction. So in that respect, we, we uh, decided to choose two, two scholars, uh, who has experiences with, with these issues, either as, as uh, scholars, because both panelists are, are scholars, but additional to this, uh, Professor Grimm uh, also served at the German Constitutional Court uh, before 19, uh, between 1987. Uh, uh, till 1999 uh, and he was maybe not not necessarily a uh, uh, judge dealing with specifically these cases but certainly one of his main area of of expertise at the court was freedom of expression, for instance. I benefited a lot when writing a book and visiting him in 1992 already. Uh, and Michal Zilkowski, who, who is also a scholar currently in, in Poland, but also as he already indicated in, in one of his interventions, served at the, at the uh, Polish Constitutional Tribunal as a as a uh, clerk for one of one of the judge justices, and he just mentioned when he was uh, uh, fired by the new Constitutional Court, the now already fake Constitutional Court. And if I can disclose that at that time I got a letter from Wojciech Sadurski, uh, whether EUI could be uh, helpful to uh, uh, rescue him. And we did, uh, and he came to EUI as a Max Weber fellow, uh, staying here for two years. Uh, so the, 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 the point of the selection, how this, this conflict between the EU law and national constitutional law uh, emerged uh, first in, in Germany and then how it is uh, a practice uh, in, in Poland uh, in the late 
the latest constitutional court, although one may say this conflict existed during the previous constitutional court uh, era as well. So uh, with this uh, introduction, first I would like to give the floor to Professor Grimm, uh, highlighting the, the, the German approach, followed by Michal's uh, presentation on the, on the Polish one. And you will see there are cross-references all over especially by the Polish Constitutional Court, which is the case with the Hungarian uh, fake Constitutional Court. They always refer to, to the German court, uh, especially when dealing with constitutional identity issues. So when the Hungarian Constitutional Court in 2016 refused to comply with the relocation plan of the, of the European Council, uh, they said, oh, we cannot comply because we have a constitutional identity uh, of being a Christian nation and we cannot accept anyone who is not Christian. And they refer to the, to the German constitutional court's previous decisions, which have nothing to do with this, of course, but still uh, those courts are very, very keen to legitimize their, their uh, uh, approach of, of this, I would say, abuse of constitutional identity. And my last word is an advertisement to, to a book just recently published by Oxford University Press by my dear supervisee here at EUI, Julian Scholtes, on the abuse of constitutional identity. With this, mm -hmm. I give the floor to Professor Grimm. Thank you, Gabor. Since uh, Gabor mentioned uh, the time of my service, uh, 1987 to 1999, uh, you may have realized that this falls uh, into the seminal changes in the world of 1989, 1990. Uh, and I can only say that it was a fascinating time on the court. Not uh, uh, only that uh, an unexpected number of totally unprecedented cases arrived in the court, but also delegation after delegation from the former socialist countries arrived in the court or countries with another authoritarian past like the South African court, for instance. So first came uh, those people of the newly elected parliaments who uh, wrote new constitutions or amended the old constitutions. And then after that had been done, the newly uh, elected or appointed uh, constitutional court uh, members came for uh, visits and down to Albania. Uh, so I owe a lot of my uh, uh, knowledge of the transition process in many countries to uh, these years. But uh, this is the past. Now to our current uh, problems. <clears throat> the, the primacy of EU law was never questioned by the federal constitutional court, but the court makes two reservations. The first reservation was mentioned. This is the identity of the German constitution. If EU law contradicts the identity of the German constitution, it is not applicable in Germany. This is old, this is old, it was, you mentioned it, it was uh, part or the main part of the so-called Solange uh, uh, case, 1974. And in this decision, uh, the German court called uh, efficient protection of fundamental rights a core element of the German constitutional identity. It, it concluded that as long as there is no equivalent protection of fundamental rights on the European level, the court, the U U uh, German court, will measure European acts according to the Bill of Rights of the German court. This, of course, was alarming to the uh, ECJ, and uh, uh, everybody knows that the ECJ uh, uh, intensified uh, its uh, uh, development of an unwritten uh, Bill of Rights uh, according to that uh, uh, decision. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the case, the, the court didn't find a contradiction between European law and uh, the German constitution. Nevertheless, the commission initiated an infringement uh, procedure. 
but uh, it contented itself with the answer that was given from, at that time, Bonn, not yet Berlin, uh, so that uh, uh, it, the case was not taken to the, uh, to the ECJ. Twelve years later, the court found that now there was a sufficient fundamental rights protection on the European level through the jurisprudence of the ECJ, uh, and so it declared that it would no longer exercise its power to review uh, European acts. But it left no doubt that the right was only suspended. It was not uh, relinquished. The identity formula was repeated in the uh, judgment on the Lisbon Treaty in 2009. The court repeated its identity reservation and now referred to a clause that, at that, at that uh, originally was not in the European treaties, but now is, uh, uh, namely Article 4, Section 2 of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, according to which the EU shall respect the national identity inherent in their fundamental structure, political and constitutional. German, in German language, it's easier formulated, national identity uh, uh, as laid down in the national constitution. So the, it's very often interesting to look to the various translations of the, uh, of the treaties. The court now linked the German constitutional identity to Article 79, Section 3 of the German Basic Law. This clause is known under the name Eternity Clause. It contains those principles or those elements of the German constitution, which are exempt from amendment. Uh, and uh, uh, the limit was now extended uh, from a uh, uh, was now extended from internal amendments to transfer of powers uh, to the uh, EU because a transfer of power is so to say a clandestine amendment to the constitution. Every power that is handed over to the European Union uh, is exercised no longer uh, according to the rules of the national constitution. So that amounts to, so to say, a tacit uh, amendment. That's to say, uh, the principles in Article 79.3 are not only unalienable, but they are also, these are the words of the court, they are also untransferable. So the identity of the German basic law is located in Article 79.3, uh, uh, the problem with identity, of course, is that it, in many countries it's extremely difficult to identify identity. This is a bit easier in Germany because we have this eternity clause and the German identity is identified with the elements that are unamendable in Article 79.3. Uh, uh, I don't expect conflicts between the ECJ and the German Constitutional Court on the level uh, of uh, uh, identity because the values that are protected by the German constitution and the values that are protected in Article 2 by the German treaties are uh, uh, identical. Why does uh, the court then uh, 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 lays a certain emphasis on the identity clause? It serves another function. It serves the function that Germany is not allowed according to the Jewish prudence of the court uh, under Article 79.3 to hand its sovereignty over to the European Union. So the court is that Germany is allowed to hand sovereign powers, sovereign rights over to the European Union, but not the sovereignty. That's to say it is not allowed to uh, cooperate into the transformation of the European Union into a state. This is now the function that the identity clause has. <clears throat> Now, the second reservation uh, concerns the uh, Ultra-Virus Act of the European Union. Uh, this was first formulated in the decision on the Maastricht Treaty, that's to say decision of 1993. And according to this judgment, European legal acts for which the EU doesn't have a competence in the treaties are inapplicable uh, in Germany. Uh, the, the fact that every European legal act <clears throat> needs a basis uh, in the treaties uh, and lacks legal validity if there is no such basis is shared by the ECJ. This is not a difference, the point of conflict between the European court and the German court. 
Uh, what is controversial is who has the power to decide who has the last word in conflicts like this. The ECJ claims the power for itself and exclusively. Uh, the German Constitutional Court claims the power for itself regarding Germany, not uh, exclusively. Uh, in a later decision, one year after uh, the decision in the Lisbon case, a case named Honeywell, the court specified the conditions under which it is willing to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, negate, uh, to use its power and to negate the validity of uh, 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 a European measure in Germany. First of all, it says it has to be an obvious violation of the treaty, not just a difference in interpretation. There's always a leeway for interpretation, and this does an obvious, an obvious uh, 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 violation of the treaty. Secondly, in addition to that, not only obvious, but a violation of the treaty that causes a power shift between the member states and the European Union. And then thirdly, only, because we'll do that only after having heard and obtained the opinion of the ECJ, that's to say after referral. Um, this became relevant uh, uh, recently, three years ago, uh, in the so-called PSPP uh, uh, judgment 2020, uh, uh, it's interesting to see that in the referral to the ECJ, uh, the uh, German court uh, found a, uh, a lacking uh, uh, competence for the European Central Bank to issue that program uh, 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 because uh, the measure was seen by the German court as uh, uh, not, uh, not only as a fiscal uh, uh, political measure, but an economic political measure. And for the economy, of course, the European Union doesn't have a competence for fiscal questions. Uh, it has the consequence. However, the ECJ couldn't find a violation at all. And uh, the German court agreed with regard to this competence problem and agreed with the uh, European court and said, okay, we accept uh, it is a measure that concerns fiscal policy and not economic policy. But it insisted that the European Central Bank failed to apply the principle of proportionality as prescribed by Article 5 of the treaties. Uh, and that the ECJ had not reprimanded the European Central Bank for this uh, omission. However, this is not, uh, strictly speaking, uh, a matter of competences, uh, but an error in applying a uh, competence. That's to say, the ultra-virus jurisprudence of the court was extended uh, to wrong uses uh, of a given competence. Uh, and the result, of course, was violation of the treaty, That's to say the PSPP program uh, cannot be executed uh, 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 with German cooperation unless, and this door was left open, unless the ECB demonstrates that the program is compatible with the principle of proportionality. Like in uh, Solange number one, the Commission initiated an infringement procedure against Germany, uh, but uh, uh, it declared to be satisfied with the answer that the federal government gave, and it again didn't bring the case to the uh, 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 ECJ. Uh, and uh, uh, the European Central Bank in turn demonstrated that its measure, its program was compatible with proportionality principles so that also the German Constitutional Court declared to be satisfied uh, by this declaration. Now, behind this controversy between the two courts is a different opinion about the legal basis for the application of EU law in Germany, or maybe in the member states altogether, but we are dealing with Germany here. Both courts agree that the EU law is neither public international law, Völkerrecht, nor national law, but an autonomous body uh, of law that flows from an independent source. This is not the controversy. The courts disagree as to the ground of the applicability of European law in the member state, Germany. The German Constitutional Court assumes 
that EU law owes its applicability in Germany exclusively to the order of the German parliament to apply European law in Germany. And this order by the German parliament is given in the ratification law of the treaties. That's to say competencies that have not been transferred in the ratification law in accordance with the German constitution cannot be the basis of European legal acts. <clears throat> legal acts without a basis um, acts ultra virus and are inapplicable. Whether Germany validly transferred powers to the EU is a question of German law and can be answered only by the German constitutional court. The ECJ, to the contrary, assumes that EU law is disconnected, meanwhile disconnected from the will of the member states and is applicable out of itself. Whether the EU has a competence or not is a question for the ECJ of European primary law and therefore an exclusive matter of the European Court of Justice. So you see this, and this is why I mention it, uh, the dissent is a dissent of a principled uh, character. Uh, each court starts from a different premise and derives its consequences from this premise in a logical way. And this is why between these two positions, there is no compromise and there is no middle way. Uh, we have now a discussion uh, whether there should be a, a super uh, court above the ECJ and the national constitutional courts. I don't discuss that. It was a discussion immediately after the PSPP judgment is already fading away. I, I'm, I'm correct. Uh, uh, you may know or realize that uh, uh, the German court uh, was heavily criticized for the judgment. Uh, and uh, uh, I myself would say the court would have had better occasion uh, to rule uh, in the way it did rule. Uh, there were other cases that had been had given a better opportunity, but uh, anyway, it missed these opportunities and shows this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, case. So it was heavily criticized. I don't want to go into detail, there are many items uh, that were on the list of, uh, of criticism, uh, but uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, ultimately uh, the criticism can only be relevant if one refutes the premises, uh, uh, the premise especially of the German constitutional court, since it is such a principled uh, uh, position which doesn't allow a compromise and uh, uh, I myself don't see how the premise of the German court can be refuted, that it is still the order of the national parliament that rule shall be uh, uh, applied. I would, like, I would like to add one more consideration uh, uh, in, uh, in the field that we are now discussing, keep discussing, because I think that it is widely overlooked and it has to do uh, with what I call the over-constitutionalization of the European Union. Uh, it's meanwhile generally accepted that the two seminal judgments of the ECJ of 1963 and 1964 constitutionalized the treaties. American scholars were the first one to discover that. Uh, Europeans hadn't noticed uh, what had happened with these uh, uh, judgments. Constitutionalized of course, doesn't mean that they have become a constitution. Uh, this accord cannot do that, could only done, be done by a, a, a treaty uh, amendment. But what it means is uh, that uh, uh, the treaties, the constitutionalized treaties are now equipped with the effects of a constitution. And the main effect of a constitution is that everything that has been regulated on constitutional level is thereby withdrawn from the democratic process, no longer open to political decisions. It's the premise of political decisions, no longer the object of political decisions. And this is what we have constitutions for. It is not an error. This is what we have constitutions for. However, because of this democracy reducing effect of constitutions, National constitutions limit themselves to regulate the process of decision-making, but leave the decisions themselves open to a political uh, process. 
The treaties are of a different kind. The treaties were not originally written with a constitution in mind, but a treaty under international law. And the treaties are full of what would be in every member state's ordinary law. This is the reason why they are so voluminous. So imagine that uh, the whole commercial code of your country is, is part of your constitution. This is what happens in the, uh, uh, in the treaties full of what would be ordinary law, what law not, not of a constitutional nature, but all that participates in the constitutional rank. That's to say it is withdrawn from the political process and what is withdrawn from the political process accrues on the side of the judiciary. And this is the reason that uh, decisions of a high political uh, impact uh, in Europe are taken in a non-political no mode the member states uh, and the European Parliament are not only sidelined, they cannot change anything. The ECJ is immunized against a redirection by way of legislation, which is normal in every democratic uh, uh, country. The only possibility is a treaty amendment and you would never get a treaty amendment for such a, uh, a matter. So my conclusion from this situation uh, uh, which I uh, call the over-constitutionalization, uh, uh, is that the national constitutional courts are the only counterweight uh, against European policy in this field, in this field where the European uh, politics are constitutionalized, uh, but uh, 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 apply to matters that are not of a constitutional nature. So since the political institutions have no possibility to exercise any influence, the national constitutional courts are the only counterweight. <clears throat> At the end, uh, uh, I, I would like to link the uh, considerations to the topic of our conference. Uh, does the judiciary uh, have means to defend European values uh, against uh, autocratic uh, or authoritarian member states? Uh, the uh, uh, German Constitutional Court after the PSPP judgment uh, was, among others, which I did not mention, was reproached of lending support to those countries who are in a process of transformation into an auto authoritarian uh, uh, system. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the Polish court immediately uh, welcomed the decision enthusiastically and said, you see what we do uh, uh, is, uh, so to say, common European practice, and even uh, the, a court like the German court is of the same uh, uh, opinion. However, uh, I see some uh, quite important differences uh, between the Polish approach and the German approach. The first one is the Polish court claims absolute primacy for the national constitution over European law, which the German court never did. To the contrary, the German constitutional court enforced the primacy of European law vis-a-vis -vis ordinary courts in Germany that were hesitant. The second difference, the Polish constitutional court declared parts of the treaty uh, in violation of the Polish constitution, which again, the German court never did. Never was a treaty provision in Germany declared incompatible with the German constitution. Uh, and thirdly, the German court, as I mentioned earlier, defines the identity, uh, uh, the Polish court, sorry, the Polish court defines the identity of the Polish constitution in contradiction to the European values, while the German court defines the identity of the basic law in conformity with uh, the uh, uh, European values. So I think with regard to this criticism, I think one cannot expect judges to render deliberately to render false decisions only in order to avoid a misunderstanding or a misuse of the right uh, uh, decisions. And certainly in my view, the jurisprudence of the German constitutional court is not an obstacle for the ECJ if the ECJ wants to enforce European values if they are violated by member states. So much for the moment, thank you. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to Michal uh, immediately and the Q&A will be 
jointly after his presentation. Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind invitation. I'm pleased to be here and be a part of this conversation. And I'm extremely grateful for what you said about uh, uh, over-constitutionalization, because I, I'm completely convinced by your concept and your idea that the constitutional courts are a natural counterbalance for the Court of Justice and the over-constitutionalization of the European Union. And I like what you said because I will try to show you uh, that this reaction, this resistance of the constitutional courts needs to be properly framed into the legal frame. So the aim of my presentation is a discussion of primacy, either of the treaties or the constitutional uh, primacy and different judicial techniques to use, which are used by the constitutional courts. By judicial techniques, I, I understand uh, the definition uh, you provided in the, in the project. So my case study uh, is um, are two, two, two judgments of the Polish Constitutional Court. One is from 2010, this is the Lisbon case. And second is a fresh judgment from 2022. Uh, this is a case concerning unconstitutionality of the uh, article of uh, 19 of the treaty. For the first time in history, Polish Constitutional Court declared that the Article 19 of the treaty is unconstitutional under certain understanding. Nevertheless, the court made a lot of uh, bold statements in the ju justification and uh, also declared that the case law of the Court of Justice is ultra virus. Um, so, uh, my general claim is that Polish Constitutional Tribunal and the Court of Justice are in a deadlock right now. Uh, and the fact that the court is captured is a one uh, possible explanation. Uh, and I will show you uh, what is the, the importance of, the, of this fact. However, there is also a second part of this story. I do believe that the uh, deeper reason for or, or of this deadlock is that um, uh, Polish Constitutional Court always referred to the absolute autonomy uh, autonomy of the Polish Constitution, absolute primacy, sometimes supremacy of the of the Constitution. And in order in order to do this, uh, to convince you to this uh, this claim, I will use eight questions which were, I believe, valid for the Constitutional Court judges in 2010 and in 2022 in order to decide case concerning the primacy. And here you have two pictures which perfectly illustrates the situation of the relationships between the Court of Justice and Polish Constitutional Court. On your right side, left side, uh, you have a picture of René Magritte, uh, made by René Magritte, the lovers, and this is a perfect situation uh, for the Court of Justice and Polish Constitutional Court relationship in 2010. And on your other side, you have a, a screen from La Notte, uh, directed by Antonioni, a couple uh, very close to divorce, uh, a couple which cannot uh, understand each other, and I think this is a current uh, situation. And uh, a few important footnotes. First of all, first judgment from 2010 was delivered by, uh, by a legal and lawful court. This is very important information. Second judgment was delivered by the capture court, court with the presence of the fake unlawful judges. Unfortunately, both judgments were published uh, in the official journal and unfortunately both judgments have been recognized and uh, recognized as effective and valid by other constitutional authorities in Poland. So far, maybe this will change, however, uh, so far both are valid and present in the legal system. Both judgments refer to the court of, uh, to the federal constitutional court in Germany. In a different way, I will show you how. Both judgments insisted on the absolute primacy of the Polish constitution. Both judgments refer to the uh, constitutional identity. However, in a two different ways, I will show you how. And the only, only the judgment uh, in Article 19 case uh, declared Court of Justice uh, case ultra virus and only the recent judgment called primacy of the EU law as a non-binding principle. It happened for the first time. Uh, why those judgments are important? Because we have 
several pending cases concerning primacy in the, in the captured constitutional court. Here you have the, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Here you have uh, the, on the on the below of the screen. Here you have the, the those cases. Three of them were submitted by judge or fake judge, I, I have to say, Kamil Zarachkevich, the same who initiated uh, Nobel Bank, uh, who was a uh, important person for the Nobel Bank case before the Court of Justice. So let's start with the question one. Um, is it like that the primacy is autotelic or uh, the primacy has its own uh, specific uh, purpose. And court of justice probably would answer that primacy is not an autotelic principle because primacy is to provide autonomy and efficiency of the European Union law. Uh, in a traditional way, Kelsen would probably say that it's absolutely aut autotelic because primacy is primacies to provide hierarchy within the legal system. Uh, and as you can see, uh, Polish Constitutional Court answered uh, for that question uh, almost the same way, both in 2010 and in 2022. Uh, Polish Constitutional Court perceives primacy as a very formal um, rule uh, which organized the hierarchical structure of the constitutional order. And when it comes to the primacy of the EU order, in both cases, the Polish Constitutional Court accepted the Court of Justice approach. Second question, what is the normative nature of the primacy? Is it a rule or is it a principle? And, Constitution, and Court of Justice would probably say it's absolutely unconditional rule. Look at the opinion 2013, which concerns the uh, accession of the European Union to the European Convention. And, uh, but Polish Constitutional Court, uh, answered this question in two uh, slightly different ways. When it comes to the primacy of the constitution for the court, it is absolutely unconditional rule. However, when it comes to the primacy of the EU law in the Lisbon case, the court pointed out that primacy of the EU law is an unconditional rule for sub-constitutional law, which was not surprising because we have direct provision in our constitution concerning this particular issue. Uh, and this is the moment when the court in the Lisbon case stopped. And it is important uh, because uh, last year when the Article 19 case was decided, uh, uh, the court said that primacy of the EU law is a principle and it needs to be balanced, always balanced, so it's not a rule, uh, with the constitutional identity, which is, of course, understood in the same way you mentioned the, the, the Hungarian Constitutional Court. You have the third question. What is the legal basis of primacy? And the Court of Justice would say that it is the nature of the EU legal order. Primacy doesn't need a particular provision, doesn't need a <clears throat> uh, literal wording in, a, in the treaties. And uh, Polish Constitutional Court, uh, again, uh, uh, gave you two different answers in 2010 and 2022. When it comes to the constitutional uh, primacy of the constitution, we have a direct legal basis. When it comes to the primacy of the EU law over constitutional law, we also have a direct uh, constitutional provisions. Very important difference. In 2010, the court accepted the Court of Justice claim concerning the legal source of the primacy of the EU law. In other words, the court accepted that, this, that the nature of the legal, EU legal order could be a source of the primacy. And uh, the court changed its opinion uh, in 2022 because Direct, the court directly expressed or pointed out that primacy is non-binding principle because mm, there, there are no provisions in the treaty proclaiming primacy. Uh, I don't want to discuss with this, this reasoning uh, and uh, maybe we could do it during the QA session. And you have a fourth question. What are the primacy consequences as a validity of the application of the law? When it comes to the primacy of the EU law, the court, the Polish Constitutional Court said that the, uh, 
the primacy of the EU law cannot affect the validity, binding force, or applicability of the Constitution. Look, here the court adopted a very uh, well known in Germany concept and differences between validity and applicability as a consequence of the primacy. And the uh, court at the same time added that in case of the constitutionality of the treaty, the treaty is valid in Poland, however, it cannot be applied. And court provided three ways how to deal with it. One way is to change the constitution, other to change the treaty, and the third, ultima ratio, is to exit the European Union. Uh, uh, look at how, how it was changed in the, in the in 2022. The court said that the primacy of the EU law cannot affect the validity and applicability of the constitution. This is the same phrase from the Lisbon case. However, the court added one additional uh, claim. In case of constitutionality, unconstitutionality of the treaty, the treaty is not valid for Poland because treaty is a, or the provision is an ultra virus act. You can see how different is. Uh, how different is this claim? And question number five, what is the scope of application of the principle of the primacy? Uh, Court of Justice would say always within their EU law uh, scope. Uh, and the constitutional tribunal would say almost the same when it comes to the constitutional law. Constitution always prevails over the EU law. Uh, this is a statement both from the 2010 judgment and recent abusive judgment. However, look at the difference, because after the court said uh, that the constitution is, uh, was always prevailing over the European Union law, uh, in the Lisbon case, the court also added that it is the court's constitutional obligation to use all possible judicial techniques to provide an interpretation coherent with the EU law. Last year, the court changed its opinion and uh, said that it's the court's goodwill because the constitutional court doesn't have to provide interpretation coherent with the European Union law. That makes a difference. Question number six, what is the judicial context of applying of the primacy? And uh, here you have the same, almost the same answers when in comes to the preliminary proceedings. In both cases, uh, Polish Constitutional Court uh, did not see any constitutional law obligation to use preliminary proceedings. However, um, uh, the court explains this uh, statement in a two different ways. In 2010, the court said that uh, it is a court obligation to consider a minimum of constitutional pluralism in order to avoid using primacy of, as a unilateral exception to the international treaty. And uh, in 2022, the court said uh, something opposite. The constitutional court in Poland doesn't have to consider the impact of the primacy claim on the European Union order. So you have a very uh, perfect example of constitutional particularism. And what is and referring to the judicial techniques as uh, they are understood in the, in the project, uh, I asked myself, what is the approach of other apex courts and whether this, this approach is relevant for the constitutional court? And unfortunately, in both cases, uh, the approach of the Supreme Court to the primacy or Supreme Administrative Court to the primacy uh, were invalid uh, the court the constitutional court uh, either in the lisbon case uh, or in the article 19 case uh, the court was not interested into this question so the last question is uh, is the approach to other constitutional courts within the eu valid for me and uh, the court the court of justice would probably say that rebellious courts shall follow non rebellious courts and in the lisbon treaty case uh, uh, we will find a lot of references to German Federal Constitutional Court, but, but also other constitutional court. But it is important to realize that those references were used to underline coherence between the Polish constitutional law and uh, the member states uh, uh, and other uh, constitutional law of the member states. So uh, a, there is a visible claim to constitutional universalism in the Lisbon Treaty case. It happened, it's, it, it's changed in, uh, oh, sorry, you don't see this here. 
um, it's changed in 2022 because the court, the captured court, used citation and references to the German Federal Constitutional Court in order to provide uh, differences, in, that, in order to underline differences between the constitutional law in Poland and in Germany and uh, uh, European, European Union. Generally, uh, uh, the captured court claimed that uh, uh, it had followed the, the German uh, the German path. And here you have a perfect example, example of the current situation between the Polish Constitutional Court is a performance of Marina Abramowicz and Ulay, the couple uh, which cannot, which was not able to, 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 to divorce of that time. And I think that the real, re the first reason is that the capture court abuses its powers. The, it, it is clearly visible that uh, the court abused references to the court, uh, federal <laughs> constitutional court in Germany. It is clearly visible that the court abused the Lisbon case by taking a part of the sentences and added something new, which completely changed the, the expression. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, I believe that there is a, a bigger problem. And this problem is, uh, I, I would call it as a very strict and a narrow understanding of the primacy. We do prefer primacy as a collision directive in a very, understood in a very Kalzenian rigid way. And I think it is a high time to think about the functional primacy, about the function of primacy. Primacy for me, and not for me, but also for many new constitutional or uh, pluralist uh, scholars, primacy is to provide something more than the hierarchical structure of the legal order. Primacy, for me at least, is, is to provide the highest possible level of human rights under the changing constitutional conditions. So uh, we have to think about, because I don't, need, as a lawyer, as a citizen, I don't believe that I need the primacy as a collision directive nowadays. Maybe it was needed when Kelsen started uh, his, his work. Maybe it was needed just after the war. But nowadays, we need something more. We need to think, just like we think about the rule of law, just like we think about uh, the constitutionalism in more substantial terms, also about the primacy. So I think that we need to start to think about the primacy, uh, new possible function, that primacy, that we, we need to use primacy only if there is a risk of lowering human rights standards, either by the constituent power or by constitutive power or by the international treaty. So for me, primacy demands a certain burden of proof. Uh, the constitutional court if the Constitutional Court would like to refer to the primacy, I believe the court should provide a compelling arguments concerning the risk of the lowering of the human rights. Otherwise, what is the additional value of the formally understood primacy? I don't know. Uh, the only additional value is a deadlock. So, unfortunately, in comparison to Germany, uh, we in Poland are in a better position because we have two provision, constitutional provisions neighboring to each other. One is about the primacy. Second is about the validity and application of the international law. And the second provision, uh, in my interpretation and interpretation of my, many of my colleagues from Poland, second provisions expresses the scope of the application of the principle of primacy. In other words, uh, Primacy is not only a directive, collision directive, it's, it has its function and cannot be used like it was used by the Constitutional Court either in 2010 or abu clearly abused in 2022. Thank you so much for your attention. So thank you for both uh, very illuminating presentations. And I would like to to open the floor, uh, maybe not only reacting to these two <clears throat> case studies, namely the German and the, the Polish one, but as we know, other member states representing here or not representing here, 
uh, are also dealing with with the same same issue. Uh, what what is, in your opinion, the the current importance of primacy, as as Michal uh, posed the question at the at the very end, or what is the importance of of constitutional pluralism altogether uh, currently? Because one one can can. Uh, uh, detect certain theoretical issues raised about the dangerous nature of constitutional pluralism uh, within the EU if, if constitutional identity can be abused, as it was the case in Hungary and Poland, uh, then this can be uh, a dangerous concept, uh, having a constitutional pluralist system within the EU altogether, just uh, emphasizing primacy. So all these issues can also be, be covered by, by questions and comments. Yes, look. Well, a question, I'm sorry, I'm not a scholar of constitutionalism, I'm a simple judge, but my point is the following. So uh, Michael said uh, the primacy has to be intended as the lack of possibility to lower the protection of fundamental rights. And we see that in many countries, the clash between the, uh, the, the, the political majority and the judiciary happens in relation to fundamental rights. So this is basically the, the point of the current situation. But my question is, uh, would it be possible, according to the constitution in, in Poland and in Germany, to lower the standard of protection of human rights at the constitutional level? Because my understanding is that in all constitutions, in, in the Italian, the, the Polish, the German, this is the minimum. And then, of, of course, in the Charter, we have new rights, which were not included in the Constitution at that time. I don't see this is the problem. I don't see that the new rights are the problem. But I wonder whether is it possible to, to lower, because I understand this is an abuse. We are not speaking about changing the Constitution, but uh, abusing the Constitution. But would it be possible to lower the standard at national level, constitutional level? Collect some, some questions. Oh, Madalina. Uh, good afternoon and congratulations to the speakers for their um, inspiring presentations. Um, my intervention is not so much a question, but um, more a reply to, to Gabor and also to, to Michal's um, uh, invitation. Gabor, you've mentioned uh, dangerous constitutional pluralism and while listening to the two speakers, um, I um, I realized there is an interesting example from Romania, from the Romanian Constitutional Court, uh, with a very dangerous use of judicial dialogue. Uh, surprisingly, in this very um, criticized decision of the Romanian Constitutional Court, where it um, rejected to apply the preliminary rulings of the Court of Justice in the Romanian rule of law saga, um, also, the Romanian Constitutional Court relied on the national constitutional identity. And in order to support that, his, uh, its own decision that, you know, principle of primacy should step back when uh, a court, the constitutional courts act within the field of national constitutional identity, it cited two decisions. And this is very surprising because it didn't only cite the decision of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, but also of the German constitutional trio, which to me, they don't seem to be on the same line as also was mentioned by, by Dieter. So I, I see that, I mean, these two days, we've talked about the beneficial effects of using judicial interaction techniques of judicial dialogue, but with the decision of the Polish constitutional tribunal, I see there is a very dangerous use of, of judicial dialogue, which um, now I come to my question, maybe to the, Speakers, how do you um, 
prevent or how do you respond to this type of dangerous judicial dialogue that, that is developing? Um, for now, we only have the example of the Romanian Constitutional Court, but in, in the future, there could be more. Um, so I'm just wondering what's, uh, how could we respond to this type of phenomenon? Thank you. So first of all, uh, to Professor Grimm's uh, point, I found it extremely interesting when you said that uh, the vice case of the uh, Modest was misunderstood or referred to disingenuously by other courts such as Polish Constitutional Court. And there is absolutely no comparison between what was at stake in the Vice case and what was in, at stake in the uh, primacy case of Polish Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. So I just wonder, Dieter, is there any way uh, that a German Constitutional Court or its individual judges, perhaps in extrajudicial forum, but when they are still judges, can somehow <laughs> make that point, sort of announce, uh, at least pronounce certain words of caution. No, that's not exactly what we meant, you know? Don't treat us as some sort of authority because you are misreading what we have said. There is that theory, I think, among other people, uh, developed by my colleague and friend and at, at Bocconi, uh, Oreste Policino, that there is this emerging group of leading courts, constitutional courts in Europe, and those which are more uh, of uh, learners or students. It's, it, it, it may sound a bit arrogant or sort of almost neo-colonial, but it's it's true that, that the jurisprudence of German court or Italian Corte Constitutionale or French Conseil Constitutional somehow weigh more heavily on the creation of legal culture in Europe than, than of these others. So maybe they also have that responsibility of clarify what they really meant to remove this aura of legitimacy from those who use them for disingenuous purposes. And, and to Professor Zhukovsky, I want to say this. Uh, I think that it would be useful for the external audience to place, especially the 2010 decision of Polish Constitutional Tribunal, the Lisbon Treaty decision in a certain political context that is the that, that the court then uh, was in the situation in which i mean it was fully independent it was fully legitimate no comparison what would happen with the fake constitutional tribunal now but it needed to err on the side of overstressing sovereignty and therefore uh, under emphasizing the uh, the uh, primacy in order to engage in a certain rhetoric, rhetoric of reassurance. No, we are really treating very seriously that we are the guardians of the Polish constitution, the Polish constitution will prevail, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, issue a very good outcome for uh, validating uh, Lisbon Treaty. That's what they wanted to achieve. And, and their rhetoric was just the means to this particular end. So whatever they said then, and by the way, it was also disingenuously used by the pseudo decision, uh, the second one. They said we are we are simply we are simply restating. We are simply using the precedent of of K three O nine, and it, it's simply not true. It's, uh, they 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 didn't say they developed it in very toxic way. So maybe it's important to look at this context. They had to use this language of undermining primacy in order to reassure the nationalistic right, the political opponents, etc. We are uh, we are protecting and policing uh, the ultimate primacy of Polish constitution. Thank you. Thank you for uh, both presentations. And I believe uh, that it is really important for, for uh, our fellow judges sitting at the table 
to underscore again how language matters. I mean, we are not talking with regard to Polish Constitutional Court about a good faith constitutional disagreement. There is a changing nature of contestation of the authority of the EU law because German court, German constitutional court and the ECJ, they might disagree and they will disagree. But the starting point is always the same. We are bound by the common discipline. We share the same values. And in the process, there might be differences, but at no point, German constitutional court nor the ECJ will call each other's existence into question. With regard to the Polish Constitutional Court as currently constituted, we are talking about a hostile contestation and a war of ideologies. So it is not on the same conceptual plane that we are talking about uh, fake Constitutional Court uh, in Poland, German Constitutional Court, because the starting points are diametrically different. Polish Constitutional Court as currently constituted starts from the hostile premise. The EU law is an alien force that must be eradicated from the uh, uh, territory of, of Poland. German Constitutional Court is always interested in having the good faith dialogue with the ECJ. They might disagree, but they will never clash at their term of uh, ideologies. And my second, uh, my second point is, uh, I think it is really important to understand how a captured constitutional court might change the internal dynamics of this uh, constitutional disagreement. Because Polish constitutional court is used by the political power to create what Otto Kirchheimer once called creating effective political images. It is not just that Polish autocrats are not interested in having an independent constitutional court, quite to the contrary. They want to keep the constitutional court in order to exert this hostile influence on the EU law and abuse the constitutional identity. So the constitutional court is needed as part of this hostile dialogue in order to uh, uh, contest the uh, authority of the EU law. But it's a different kind of contestation of the authority of the EU law that we are dealing with right now. And I think language do matter here. Thank you very much. While I really enjoy this academic conversation, I, I would also encourage uh, uh, judges, practitioners, how these, these scholarly uh, discussion affects uh, uh, their work. I, I do not want to provoke anyone, but I would really be curious to see whether this is on the level of, of constitutional courts and, and European courts and not affecting the level of, of ordinary uh, courts uh, daily practice. Okay, let us give back the floor uh, to the to the panelists, and if there will be some some reactions, we will still have time. So let us start with Michal first. Thank you for all the comments and questions. Referring to the first one, I would like to say that. Yes, it is possible to have a lower standards of human rights on your constitutional level in at least two cases. First, it happens when you have a constitutional court which is less progressive uh, and developed than the standard of international law. Uh, second, uh, it happens when you, have, when you do not have a well-developed constitutional case law at the moment in comparison to the development of the international law or European Union law. And I will give you three examples. For instance, the AI Act nowadays provides higher standards when it comes to the prohibition of manipulation by the AI. Uh, for instance, European Convention provides a higher standards when it comes to the right to marriage in comparison to the Polish Constitution and Polish Constitutional Law. Uh, and for instance, European Convention provides higher standards when it comes to the non refoulement principle than the Constitution. And European Convention also provided for a very long time higher standards when it came to the freedom of expression, which was perfectly described and discussed in the book 
uh, of Professor Sadurski. Uh, so, uh, um, um, and I totally agree that uh, the context of the Lisbon Treaty is, ex is extremely, extremely important. Honestly, I don't believe that the judgment would be possible without those those reservation and without those those references. What I would like to say is that it's a matter of interpretation in, Pol in the Polish case. So there is a room, there is a space for less confrontative, less. Uh, aggressive, I, I, would, I would say, interpretation of the principle of primacy. We have a doctrinal, and uh, we have provisions, we have doctrinal space. Maybe we can do it, and this is my call. Let's, let's do it to avoid that kind of direct clash in the future. Maybe in next two years, we will have a new court, which I believe should be more open for different uh, different constitutional ideas and more open for those nuances. And I don't blame the court in the Lisbon case for what the court did. No, I just wanted to say that it was a contextual decision which was directly abused nowadays. And I believe that this is a lesson for us, for our future. And there is a room for a change, or at least I hope there is a room for a change. Sorry for talking to. Professor Gim. <clears throat> With regard to lowering the standard of fundamental rights, <clears throat> I would like to mention a case uh, that bothered me very much, although it doesn't have to do with uh, the European Union. There is a rule in German law, German ships in the high sea, the German law applies, that's to say, also the high German standard of fundamental rights protection. Now, the consequence of that was that uh, ship owners, German ship owners, flagged out their ships in order to, to sail under a flag of a low standard country. The German government tried to react to that and created what it called a second ship register, in which uh, it is said if you register in that uh, ship register as a German uh, ship owner, German law applies uh, on German boats, but not completely. Uh, and the diminution was uh, drastic. Yeah, it was no, not just tiny. So the situation, this was challenged for the Constitutional Court from the labor unions in Germany. <clears throat> Although none of the people sailing below the captain were Germans, by the way, but uh, the fundamental rights don't not only apply to Germans. So the question for the court was, if we uphold the high standard of fundamental rights protection in this area, there will no longer be a field of application for these rights. If we want to keep an application for the rights, we have to lower the standard. And this was a dilemma, which in this uh, uh, sharpness uh, is not presented in, within the European Union. Uh, the, court, uh, the court lowered the standard, uh, but tried to insist on some uh, basic guarantees that cannot be uh, violated. Now, in, 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 uh, within the European Union, of course, the standard of fundamental rights protection is a matter of interpretation of fundamental rights, and it has changed over time uh, quite often. So in principle, this is possible. A specific difficulty with the, in the European Union to me seems to be that we are still facing a situation where the four economic freedoms, which are not identical with the Bill of Rights, they are outside the Bill of Rights, uh, are so-called super freedoms, super liberties in the European Union, whereas very often other rights, personal rights, communication rights, uh, tend to come in, on to, you know, the second, into the second place. This, I think, is a source of conflict uh, uh, when it comes to lowering fundamental rights. Uh, second question, I'm so sorry, but acoustically I didn't get uh, 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 what was said, so I cannot reply to that. I immediately say to Wojciech Sadowski's uh, case. I think that, uh, I think that uh, a court, a national court, should take into account the possible misunderstandings, <laughs> willingly or not willingly, of other courts, but not by adapting the ruling but by adapting the language, 
you know, the language matters and you can't foresee, you could foresee what the Polish government would say and the Polish court would say. So one can already build a wall against misunderstandings. This I would find uh, uh, necessary. Uh, another question on the same line is, uh, does uh, a national court only take national interests into account when it uh, uh, has to evaluate European law? And again, the PSPP case gives uh, an example. Uh, Germany asked for a pre application of the principle of proportionality, but more or less the German court only asked which interests in Germany between, let's say, those who save money in the bank and those who invest, etc. What uh, the German interests game came into the play of the proportionality test. But of course, it's a European matter. And the interests of uh, people in other countries also have to be taken into account when you are outside Germany. And what was true for Germany was certainly not true for Greece or uh, for, for other countries. So I think this is a uh, this is a, uh, an uh, attempt what the German court could have done uh, uh, better. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, I, 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 I agree fully with you, but uh, in order to illustrate what you said, uh, I would again uh, uh, report a, uh, an experience. Uh, two weeks after the Maastricht uh, decision had been handed down by the German Constitutional Court, the ECJ visited the German court in Karlsruhe. Uh, the visit was long planned and that it was shortly after the Maastricht decision was not foreseen when the dates were fixed, but this was the situation. So, of course, one talk, talked about the Maastricht decision, but the talk was more or less, in my memory, the following. The Germans said, uh, uh, you are wrong, but we understand why you have this position. And the Europeans said, you are wrong, but we understand why you have this position. And this is not a hostile dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Karolina Kotzemba, EUI. I have uh, one comment and one question to Michal. Uh, I would like to develop your response to the first question about limiting, limiting human rights by constitutional courts. Uh, you gave us more abstract examples. And I want to tell you about some practical examples that already we had in Poland and looking at uh, reproductive rights, for example, abortion judgments, not even 2020 ruled by this captured court, but also 1997. So from the beginning of uh, working of constitutional court, many times it happened that constitutional court limited human rights. So. I think maybe we have, it's it's a solution uh, treating the uh, primacy of EU law seriously, as you said, as a, maybe a frame for constitutional court to not limit human rights. And my second, also very practical question, is about uh, captured court. You mentioned it many times that the court is captured. So, and now, as we know, of course, uh, law and justice party failed in elections. So it's time of cleaning after law and justice party ruling, uh, not, yeah, government. And what in your opinion can happen with this ruling that you commented as it was ruled by capture court and what new court can do and what can be the new court? I mean, you are a constitutional lawyer and maybe it's also a question for other Polish scholars. Practically, uh, it's very, turbulent time because how to how to clean it's my question how to how to treat this uh, judgment it's difficult probably but i would like to discuss it thank you please Yes, uh, I would like to only res briefly respond to your suggestion Gabor about uh, if that's a problem a problem only uh, of an abstract conversation among academics or if it has also consequences on our daily practice and I think as a judge, it has very indeed consequences of our daily practice, because as we know, uh, also the direct, uh, 
direct applicability of EU law is a consequence of primacy. So a judge in Poland could say, or in Romania could say, well, I don't apply uh, directly EU law because um, I simply follow my constitutional court and I don't think that I should directly apply EU law. So that then brings with it the problem of mutual trust, of a breach in mutual trust, because uh, then another judge in another EU country could say, well, I don't recognize or I don't execute anymore a decision coming from a Poland judge or from a Romanian judge or from another judge where is a rule of law crisis, because I'm not sure that they guarantee a direct application of EU law. I'm not sure that they applied or that they examined it in this case, EU law. So. Um, this trigger, of course, a problem of mutual trust. And uh, then I have just brief questions for uh, the panelists of, um, for this agreement in particular. Um, when uh, the constitution, German Constitutional Court ruled the PSPP decision, um, didn't the court foresee that the, the judgment uh, could be abused or misused by other constitutional courts since uh, of course, the rule of law uh, crisis in Poland already broke out, and or was that was was that at that time any conversation about that of the consequences uh, um, of uh, of this decision in an interconnected system? Thank you. Thank you for these excellent questions. Uh, the lunch is approaching us, but these are very very. Very interesting question. So if you you can answer briefly, mm -hmm. but you mean, I think. Yeah. Okay, this <laughs> time <laughs> you start. Uh, I I uh, uh, I start with the with the last question. Of course, I don't know. I was not no longer in the court. I don't know whether the court was aware of the possibility or even the likelihood of a misuse of its, uh, uh, of its uh, uh, decision. It must have been somehow on the minds of the people. Uh, and as I said, I would uh, see possibilities uh, to react or against that in a pre more preventive way. Uh, but when I read the decision, I don't find anything of it. I don't find an attempt. Uh, to uh, prevent uh, misuse. But again, I would like to make it very clear, uh, you cannot as you cannot expect of a judge that he gives renders the wrong decision in order not to be misunderstood. I think this is impossible. So uh, I, I, I do not really know. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, other, uh, the other question, uh, I think, is more important when we leave the European Union and come to the European Convention of, of, uh, of Human Rights. The European Convention uh, has to guarantee a minimum standard of fundamental rights protection. It has not uh, a mandate to harmonize the jurisprudence. And there is a rule which is very important in my mind. I think it's Article 51, but maybe it's 53, where it says, the jurisprudence of the uh, European Court of Human Rights may not lower the fundamental rights standard of the national level. It can uh, uh, increase it, but not decrease it. This becomes a problem uh, whenever cases come that arise from uh, private lawsuits, uh, to say from cases where both parties have fundamental rights so that the balance has to be struck. And if the European Court of Human Rights changes the balance that the national court struck, then it inevitably lowers the standard of the fundamental rights protection of the party that won in the national court. And I think that the European Court of Human Rights is not uh, sufficiently aware of that problem uh, and uh, is uh, quite willing uh, to change the balance that was struck by a, a, a national court. So here I see a certain problem uh, that needs uh, to be solved. Michal? Thank you. Very brief comment. Uh, starting from the last intervention, uh, uh, thank you for this, because I, I do believe that those abstract academic uh, considerations have an impact. And uh, I will give you two examples, because it happened in Poland, uh, uh, at least in two uh, set of cases. Uh, uh, departure from the principle of primacy uh, was 
uh, created opportunity for the part of the Supreme Court, uh, uh, opportunity not to follow uh, the Court of Justice uh, case law in the rule of law cases. Uh, the Supreme Court said, okay, since we don't have to follow due to the primacy of our constitution, it's not uh, our task. And the second, more interesting for, for, I believe, for judges, is a series of cases concerning the uh, consumer's protection and loans in foreign currency. Uh, because after the judgment uh, concerning the primacy, part of the courts, uh, which are not necessarily in favor of, of, uh, uh, of the, the consumer's protection against uh, banks uh, may say that uh, it is not our task to follow the recent uh, Court of Justice judgments. Uh, we may stay with our rigid interpretation of the, of the consumer's law and uh, civil code. I'm so sorry, Carolina, that, that, that I did not give the example of the abortion law because this is this is the, the most important example. And I, I don't believe that I have a, a short answer for your second question, which I value very much. And I, I hope I will uh, 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 replay to it during the lunch. Uh, but I believe that, uh, uh, no, 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 I don't want to uh, prevent you from your right to lunch. And uh, so I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Yes, the lunch is already here. So uh, I, I conclude this uh, by, by thanking everyone here, not only the panelists, but first of all, of course, to them, but the excellent provocative questions uh, you, you raised and, and um, stimulated the, the discussion, which I very much enjoyed. So uh, let us thank the panelists. Uh, uh, here and and also the the questions. Thank you, thank you, Federica. Um, yes, that's why I'm sitting up here um, because um, I've got the pleasure of having the um, chairing the last session, and it kind of uh, on one point nicely. Um, smoothly goes into um, the presentation that will be made uh, by my former colleague from the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights uh, of the OSC that will be presenting the ODIA recommendations on judicial independence and accountability. It's a, she will tell you all of the details. Carolyn Hammer, welcome. Um, we're very happy to have you here and she will also, I think, um, maybe answer some of the questions through her presentation, not directly, but that have popped up about the role of international organizations. Or well, is it really important to have soft law? How does that help um, in rule of law issues? And then coming back to the point that we just discussed, it's also kind of a nice transition because we talk about the freedom of expression of judges and association of judges. Uh, I mentioned, okay, the usual suspect, Poland, and, you know, the law that apparently allows this to happen. But what happens with the repercussions? When the EU, we talk about the EU and we talk about disciplinary measures of judges. Carolyn, on the other hand, um, my former colleague, as I work there as well, will look, I think, broader of what kind of repercussions might be uh, possible. You can think about that in states that are beyond the European Union, where rule of law is really not as, um, yeah, we, would, we complain about it for the last few days, not in such good shape in the European Union, but um, in the OEC, and this includes the entire of Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, um, North America, Canada, um, Russia, um, and Central Asia. And with that, um, I wanted to pass the floor to Carolyn. Um, of course, without any expectations that you will answer these questions, but this is just food for thought um, as you go through your presentation. Please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Marta. And uh, the presentation is on. It, it, the presentation is on here. That's fine, and I can use it on my screen. No, no, it, I'm good to sit here because I'm going to look at this okay. one. Yeah. Um, maybe I would just ask uh, while I start the presentation if okay. we could also, uh, for those who are inside the room, uh, I have some published copies of the document which I will be talking about today. So these. These are the recommendations on judicial independence and accountability, which have just uh, a few days ago been published by ODIR and which are called the Warsaw recommendations. So there may be some people in this room who are familiar with uh, a previous document published by ODIR in this area, which I will talk about later on. But what is important for you to know is that although this copy you are receiving here does not say Warsaw recommendations on the cover, uh, the, the document itself, which appears online, is called Warsaw recommendations. And this is how we will now refer to them. So I have just a few minutes today for the presentation. And I wanted to leave time to answer questions or to participate in the discussion. Uh, which we will have later. I have to say that these past two days uh, being here for me have been really interesting ones. Uh, I've spent the last approximately six years working as a rule of law advisor at ODIR, uh, communicating with many uh, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, civil society, defense attorneys from across the OSCE region. And I never stopped learning um, from the presentations and the interventions that I hear from different experts in the field. So thank you very much to EUI for having me here today and for allowing me to listen into these discussions. What I wanted to do first today would just be to give you a very brief background of uh, the work of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in the area of judicial independence, to talk a little bit about how we as an organization reviewed the key recommendations on judicial independence, which we published in 2010, and which subsequently became a sort of soft law, or as I feel a little bit more comfortable saying, quasi soft law, though I don't know if that is a real term. I, I don't, people tell me these are not soft laws, so I say quasi soft law. Um, I want to give you a brief overview of the Warsaw recommendations, which you now have in your hand and which I will share the link uh, to in the chat for those who are online. And uh, then just to suggest some possible next steps and opportunities, what we are going to do with this document. So um, background here. Uh, for those who are not as familiar with OSCE, we are uh, a 57 participating state, not member state um, organization, though not uh, an organization with legal personality under international law. What does this mean? This means that we have uh, politically binding commitments made by all OSCE participating states. These are not legally binding commitments. And I put here uh, OSCE commitments and not regarding the rule of law and judicial independence, because uh, as was mentioned by Marta, uh, we have as participating states, uh, we always say from Vancouver to Vladivostok. So this is Canada, United States, Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, South Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, this includes the Russian Federation, this includes Belarus, uh, this includes uh, yeah. Mongolia, all the way over uh, that far. And it's worth noting that our organization is a consensus-based organization, meaning all uh, decisions are taken on the basis of consensus. I am sure you can imagine with the list of participating states, which I have just mentioned, uh, what the principle of consensus looks like these days inside the organization. And we have had no significant new rule of law related commitments made by our participating states, in fact, since 2008. So the rule of law, in fact, is an area where it is even more difficult than others uh, to achieve consensus among participating states. 
It's also worth noting um, that when we talk about OSCE, we are talking about uh, judicial independence and the rule of law within the context of a security organization. So this is something uh, which is a very, I think, unique approach among the other international actors who are working on this topic of judicial independence. And here we see that respect for the rule of law, including an independent judiciary, is important for human security more generally, and our approach uh, comes from that direction. Um, I would also note when talking about OSCE commitments in the area of rule of law, that we also have a significant number of commitments on the role of judicial associations in protecting and promoting respect for the rule of law. So uh, I would turn then to ODIR and ODIR's mandate and essentially, to summarize very briefly, our mandate is to support participating states in upholding the rule of law related commitments, which they have voluntarily undertaken. So we work on the basis of request. We work only where we are asked to work. We work only when and where there is a willingness for us to work. We are not a watchdog who can work where our work is not wanted. Now, here um, I have a slide on review of the key recommendations. Essentially, um, key recommendations were published in 2010, but if we think about the landscape of judicial independence since 2010, we can see that many new practices, problems, challenges emerged during that time. The key recommendations for those who know them are focused very much on the role of judicial councils. And I think at that time within the sort of international uh, organization landscape, there was really a promotion of uh, the judicial council model as a method for guaranteeing and supporting judicial independence. What did we see in the meantime? We saw the pendulum in many contexts swing to the other side and judicial councils uh, begin to be used not to support the independence of the judiciary, but rather to uh, insulate the judiciary. We saw the problem of accountability of judicial councils really rise to the top of, uh, of the agenda of civil society, of field offices in many OSCE participating states. And we began to understand that we needed to provide some further guidance, for example, with respect to that issue. Touching on many of the topics that we've been discussing during this conference, we also saw that the geographic scope of these original uh, recommendations uh, was perhaps not broad enough and that we needed to be able to speak to some of the phenomena that we observed outside of just Eastern Europe, Central Asia and South Caucasus. So we saw questions from Central Europe, um, from Western Europe, from uh, Southeastern Europe in particular. So we needed to look at this tool and to understand whether we needed to expand the geographic scope. We started the process of review of the key recommendations in 2019. And so I put here evolution of norms. I think when we started looking at the document, we didn't understand what an explosion of uh, new normative content jurisprudence would emerge uh, from European Court of Human Rights, from Court of Justice of the European Union during that time but uh, it, uh, we tried to ensure that our process would encompass this as well. How did we go about this? This is, I think, what is unique about um, the way that the document that you have in front of you was developed and what makes it, uh, what gives it some validity and weight. And this is that we organized a very broad uh, consultation process in order to understand the standards, challenges, and good practices across the entire OSCE region. So there are people uh, within this room who have participated in this consultation process. Uh, for those, I thank you very much. There were a few hundred um, experts who we consulted in many, many, many of the OSCE participating states. So not just in one geographic area. We talked to judges. We talked to members of judicial councils, to representatives of judicial training bodies, of ministries of justice, to academics, to civil society, uh, to defense counsel, to prosecutors. And what we tried to do was to understand uh, 
where the gaps were, where our, uh, our voice was needed inside of all of this, and uh, to look not only at standards, but to look at um, some of the good practices and the problematic practices. Now we set some success criteria for what should come out of this process. And I think it's important maybe to understand at least a few of these so that when you look at the document, you know where it's coming from. I think the most important one of these that I would mention is that we wanted um, this to be a document which would be based on practical experience and to deliver a practical tool. And so this was not intended to be an exhaustive compilation of standards. It's not an academic document, this is clear. And it's not even really a standard setting document. So when we're talking about, um, when we heard uh, the presentations yesterday where there were some reflections on soft law and the use of soft law by uh, especially the European Court of Human Rights, I see this as something that could be used by those bodies, but the fact that something maybe isn't contained inside this document um, doesn't mean that that is not a, a part of the normative landscape as we would see it. So um, this is really something that we wanted uh, not to weaken the existing standards, but rather which has the intention and the purpose to only uh, support judicial independence and accountability and to support a concept of separated powers more generally. Um, I will go to the next slide, which is just a very brief overview of what's inside here. Essentially, we decided to focus on four thematic areas. So we did a gap analysis and, uh, and options consultation which showed us that in addition to talking about judicial uh, councils and specifically the accountability of judicial councils and self-governing bodies, that we needed to talk about disciplinary proceedings and disciplinary bodies, uh, that we needed uh, to talk about freedom of expression and association of judges. And this is an area where we were uh, privileged to work together with Marta and uh, to have some really uh, fruitful consultation here at EUI uh, approximately a year and a half ago. And um, to look at the topic of the transfer of judges within or between courts. This is an area where in particular, we saw a real gap in uh, I would say the normative picture, but where there were many problematic practices that were, um, that were something that we needed to understand and where we needed to be able to make some recommendations regarding where the lines would lie. The last one here is with regard to equality, diversity, and non-discrimination. This is very much connected to public trust and confidence in the judiciary and to access to justice and connects to Odir's earlier work on the area of uh, gender diversity and justice. So looking at how, uh, who participates in the judiciary and how they participate connects to uh, ultimately to realization of uh, fair trial rights and to protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Um, I would point, uh, having listened to the discussions and especially the hypotheticals that we've been talking about, I would point to a few paragraphs where uh, these recommendations address and I would say more or less uh, are consistent with some of the conclusions that we arrived at during the discussions. So we talked about uh, in one of the hypotheticals about this topic of the membership of bodies who decide on judicial discipline and about who initiates disciplinary proceedings. You can see in paragraph uh, 17 of this document that we have uh, some language on the membership of bodies deciding on judicial discipline. And we also heard uh, from practitioners about the very wide variety of practices in this area. We also go uh, fairly far into procedural guarantees in disciplinary proceedings, because in practice, this is, we could see a, a huge problem in uh, a number of participating states. Um, there was a comment earlier about the distinction between codes of ethics and ethical rules versus disciplinary rules and, uh, and how these must be separate from one another. We have this in, uh, if you look at paragraph 25, you'll see uh, some language on that. 
With regard to the topic of uh, freedom of expression of judges, of course, we have a, a section in there on uh, this topic. This is 27 to 29. And when we were talking about uh, the participation of judges in public debate related to uh, policies uh, connected to the rule of law, connected to judicial reform, I would just say that uh, one of the, the sources of soft law that we looked at as well were Odir's own opinions. And in Odir's own opinions on uh, laws and draft laws, we've also consistently reiterated that it's, the, it's good practice when initiating fundamental reforms of the justice system for this consultation of the judiciary and of civil society uh, on those reforms to take place. We can also find that in the European uh, Charter on the Statute for Judges and in uh, the CCJE's work. We also, uh, of course, have a section on freedom of association of judges inside these recommendations. And I think the conclusions very much follow what we came to at the end of the case study. So uh, this is in very brief, the document that you have in front of you. Um, how do we as ODIR see next steps? Because this is a consultation process that took more than four years. Um, what will we do now with this document is, uh, aside from translate it into different languages and disseminate it? This is not meant just to be a words that are sitting on paper, um, but rather for us, um, these are a starting point to talk about some of the issues which are mentioned inside here. So it's, I would say one thing to participate in a discussion, maybe like the one that we are having today, uh, where we can speak fairly freely. It's quite another uh, to talk about these topics as I have done in the past in uh, contexts where there is no independent judiciary where powers are not separated at all, where there may be poor respect for uh, the rule of law, where there may not be genuine democratic pluralism, where there is not a system of uh, checks and balances which functions well, and where even talking about a concept of separated powers may be uh, a difficult one to approach. So for us as an international organization, what having a document and a publication like this allows us to do is to, to share it and then to receive the question back. Um, okay, you say here, A, B, C, D, but in practice, what does this mean? How, how within our legal system could we enact this? Um, we disagree with you when you have stated A, B, C, D, don't you understand that uh, the situation in our country is such and such. This is very much a, a space that receiving a poor reaction, I think, to what is written here is just as important as receiving a positive reaction because it allows dialogue and it allows discussion of challenging and problematic issues to take place. And it allows us as an, uh, as an organization to understand where our support may be wanted needed or possible. So this can come from institutional actors um, who may request us to provide them with support, who may request uh, capacity building activities. It may also come from civil society. And it may also result in, as it has in other contexts, uh, requests for us as an organization to carry out the monitoring of processes related to judicial administration. So for example, right now, um, we are finalizing monitoring of the process of pre-vetting of candidates to uh, the Judicial Council in Moldova. This is something that we were requested to do by the ombudsperson of the country where we've carried out this monitoring, where we've published an interim report and where we will continue uh, doing the monitoring and providing recommendations as the process moves along. So uh, with that, I would like to also invite anybody here who would want to uh, work together with ODIR on any of these issues, either within your own national jurisdiction, but also in the context of 
regional or international work which ODIR does uh, together with other participating states uh, to be in contact with me and to let me know that you know this may be something that you're interested in and available for. A lot of the work we do is uh, at the regional or international level where we may bring together practitioners from different participating states in order to exchange experience. So even if the challenges uh, which you see depicted in here are not ones that you find in your national uh, context, uh, we still may have some space to work together in the context of others who have questions about these topics. Um, with that, I would like to thank you. And I'm very open for questions, feedback, or further discussion of these issues. Thanks. Carolyn, thank you very much for that very concise and clear uh, presentation. Um, it was a pleasure, of course, to, to be a very small part of that project because I think uh, the updating of it was highly um, yeah, needed. Um, I would maybe propose to you that we would take all, well, do you want to take the questions, Federica, first for Carolyn or all together at the end? Okay, so in that case, Carolyn, if you don't mind, I will pass the floor to uh, Maria Rosaria Guglielmi, um, uh, who is, uh, will talk about the role of European Judiciary Associations before the CGEU. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and the opportunity to take part in this uh, interesting workshop. Uh, I'm the president of uh, Medel. I'm prosecutor, but I'm, I'm taking the floor as the president of um, Medel, as I told you, an umbrella association um, which uh, gathers together uh, 25 different associations of judges and uh, uh, prosecutors. Um, I, I think that the uh, Polish experience uh, of uh, systematically uh, demolishing the rule of law uh, by subjugating the judiciary to the executive uh, uh, power and undermining the system, uh, not only based not only on the primacy of the European Union, but also uh, on the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, this experience, uh, we can say, uh, also marked uh, a watershed for national and uh, European judicial associations. We can say that this experience um, changed the, their history. Uh, the commitment um, to defend independence of the judiciary, uh, which is written in to the statutes of all judicial uh, associations. This commitment has been translated uh, into a collective action, uh, which today brings together all the uh, associations operating at European level, the national associations, supported by academia, lawyers, and representatives of civil society. And this collective action uh, developed primarily uh, on an institutional uh, level. So the judicial associations, the European judicial associations uh, encouraged the uh, uh, European institutions to take the uh, action necessary to defend uh, for instance, the judiciary in Poland, but also through um, symbolic events, um, as was the case of the, um, the march of 1,000 robes in Warsaw in 2020, and eventually in the form of action in court. Um, the famous jurist Stefano Rodotà said <laughs> Uh, that in the silence of the politics uh, were the judges uh, who made uh, Europe uh, by acting as a judges of a community uh, based not only not on on the force of the of a common army but uh, on the principles of the rule of law by developing uh, uh, through the dialogue with European courts all the implications 
of our supranational system protecting uh, rights and freedoms. And today we can say that uh, using the tools of law and intensifying this dialogue based on principles and norms, independent Polish judges, uh, in spite of the Mazol law, uh, supported by the uh, associations, national associations, European associations, uh, realized what uh, Eva Letoska uh, defined the judicial resistance strategy involving the use of uh, European law. And these judges contributed to the resilience of the common area of our common area of justice and of the underpinning judicial architecture in a context of a, a serious and systemic crisis of rule of law. And through this dialogue, the Court of Justice uh, had the opportunity to develop what has been labeled as existential jurisprudence, reaffirming that rule of law is an integral part of the uh, European Union's uh, very identity and defend fundamental values uh, of the EU legal order against rule of law uh, backsliding. So, and along this uh, axis, of uh, bottom top judicial interaction. So from national judges to European courts as uh, defined by Professor John Morgan. So this axis of bottom top judicial interaction, the judicial associations uh, started to act, act as a relevant uh, advocacy actors and the source of information at uh, EU level. And this is a phenomenon uh, that can, we can observe uh, at level of both national and European associations. And it can be considered a further development of the European dimension uh, uh, taken by all judicial systems. Uh, this is an, the initiative of a judicial association, the Association of Portuguese Judges, which uh, lies, as you know, at the origin of the groundbreaking judgment of the European Court of Justice, uh, rightly considered uh, the most important judgment since uh, mm. Levert, uh, as regards the meaning and scope of the principle of the rule of law in the EU legal system. So even though originated in a different context from the Polish one, this initiative marked a leap forward in the role of judicial associations with regard to the defense of the rule of law and independence of the judiciary. And it was an inspiring initiative, uh, a further example of actions that lies along this bottom uh, top axis of interaction based on uh, referrals for preliminary ruling is represented uh, by the role played by the Romanian associations, as Dragos explained uh, yesterday, with the reforms um, of disciplinary, civil and criminal uh, liability of magistrates in Romania. And uh, whatever the outcome that this initiative uh, will eventually have before the General Court of the European uh, Union, we are now in a, a different new, uh, a new scenario with the action brought in August 2022 and February 2023 by uh, ju European Judicial Associations, three European Umbrella Associations, um, MEDEL, the um, Association of European Administrative Judges and the European Association of Judges and the Dutch Foundation Judges for Judges uh, to sue the uh, Council of the European Union and European Commission for the positive assessment of the Polish recovery and resilience uh, plan. So to, to use once again the uh, descriptive scheme proposed by uh, Professor John Morin, uh, this initiative can be considered uh, a particular form of uh, bottom top interaction with associations uh, not being uh, backstage, but uh, acting directly as a parties entering uh, as actors on, on stage. So the, the actions uh, 
seek the annulment of the council decision, uh, specific, specifically as regards its rule of law milestones and the uh, financing and law agreements uh, containing details on how the European Union funds uh, will be, pay, be pay out to Poland by the Commission. Uh, the four associations considered that uh, the milestones concerned are inconsistent with uh, the case law of the European Court of Justice and insufficient to guarantee effective judicial uh, protection. So, of course, the actions uh, advance a number of uh, different pleas in law. Uh, the first set of pleas concerns the unlawful disciplinary sanctions imposed on uh, some Polish judges and the uh, review procedure. So the, the, the reform described in the annexes of the contested decision uh, was aimed at uh, remedying the situation of judges affected by uh, the decision of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court by granting uh, judges access to have their cases reviewed by a court that meets the requirement of Article 19 paragraph one of the Treaty of the European uh, uh, Union. And the associations um, claimed that the milestones are inconsistent with the case law of the Court of Justice concerning the disciplinary, uh, disciplinary chamber uh, in, that, in that they uh, accord legal effects to the decision. So the milestones accord legal effects to the decision of the disciplinary chamber rather than considering them uh, null and void. Uh, they impose additional procedural burdens, uh, uncertainty and delays on judges affected by unlawful decision of the disciplinary chamber uh, by requiring the judges uh, in question to uh, initiate a new set of uh, proceedings before a newly uh, chamber in the Supreme Court to clear their name. And uh, the milestones uh, do not even foresee the judges uh, in question being at least uh, temporarily reinstated pending the outcome of uh, review proceedings. So this approach uh, is in contrast to the situation that would comply with the case law of the Court of Justice based on Article 2 and 19 of the Treaty of the European Union and Article 47 of the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. And uh, this approach also, uh, we can say, undermines the authority of the Court of Justice. And in addition, by acting inconsistently with the case law of the Court of Justice, um, we can say that the Council has infringed the duty of mutual, mutual sincere cooperation imposed uh, on the EU institutions by Article 13, uh, the Treaty of, of the Treaty of the European uh, of the European Union. And second, the second set of pleas in law um, on which the, the action is based relates to the ineffectiveness of controls in the absence of effective judicial protection. So in, um, in accordance with the um, Article 20 of the Recovery and Resilience Funds Regulation, uh, milestones linked to the protection of financial interests of the uh, Union should be set out in order to ensure compliance with Article 22 of that regulation, which requires member states as recipients of uh, funds to take all the appropriate measures to protect the financial interest of the Union and to ensure that the use of uh, funds in relation to measures supported by the recovery and resilience uh, funds complies with the applicable, uh, applicable Union and national law. Uh, in particular regarding the prevention, detection, and uh, correction of fraud, uh, corruption, and conflict of uh, interests. And this obligation stems also from Article 325 of the Treaty of the Function of the European Union, uh, which requires effective and efficient internal control. So the, the proposed milestones um, mainly concerning the scope of the jurisdiction of the uh, Supreme Court uh, Disciplinary Chamber, uh, 
disciplinary li liability, uh, procedural guarantees in uh, disciplinary proceedings for judges. So uh, the proposed milestones are insufficient to reestablish effective judicial protection uh, in Poland. According, of course, this is our opinion, since they fail to address all the deficiencies uh, identified by the European uh, institution themselves. So um, the, disciplinary, the disciplinary proceedings for judges uh, and the uh, irregular decomposed chamber of the Supreme Court uh, are one aspect of a much wider uh, problem. Um, for instance, we have in Poland the problem of the uh, uh, the role of the Minister of Justice and uh, general prosecutors. Um, so the, the prosecution service is in, in the hands of the Minister of Justice, who is also general prosecutor. And of course, we have the problem with the Constitutional Tribunal, uh, uh, which does not fulfill the requirements of an independent and impartial tribunal established by, uh, by law. Uh, of course, there is uh, a major topic represented by the admissibility of the action, so the spending requirements uh, for the purpose of action uh, for annulment under Article 263 <laughs> of the Treaty of, of the Functioning of the European Union. Uh, so since the case is still pending, I will not go into details. Uh, I, I can, uh, and I want just to stress that uh, in this regard, that at the end of March 2023, uh, the General Court found it, uh, it appropriate to continue the uh, proceedings on the substance before ruling on the uh, defensive arguments pertaining the uh, admissibility of the action. Uh, so once again, so I can say that the initiative uh, of the four uh, European uh, uh, judges uh, and prosecutors uh, associations uh, suing uh, European Union institutions is, represents an unprecedented exceptional step, we can say, which uh, hopefully will not occur uh, again beyond the uh, current uh, exceptional uh, context. Uh, but from the um, judicial association's perspective, uh, this was a necessary step uh, taking into account what he, today is at stake, not only, not only an independent uh, judicial system, but in our, our opinion, the future of the European democracy and of the uh, European Union as a community based on uh, rule of law, uh, fundamental rights that are uh, founding and not negotiable uh, values. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria Zaria. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a real pleasure to listen to you and to the initiatives that the associations of European judges and prosecutors have and the, the inroads that you are making to, um, I think, just as international organisations, um, to assist in, you know, um, bringing forth the rule of law in through all doors and all windows possible. And I think it's a very strong, I personally think it's a very strong instrument that um, Mader has, has instituted. And I, all I can do is hope that for a good result. Um, I also uh, take the point of, um, looking at the scope, the rule of law in the scope of a larger context as one would with the OSCE. Um, and that's not just because I had worked there, but just because that I know that for a very, very long time, uh, the European Union and all the countries in the European Union was seen as the example for everybody in the region. Um, now, 
yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit less the case. If you can do it, why can't we do it? Um, if you're going to be all at the permanent council, not at the ODIR, because that's a separate institution, but at the permanent council of the OEC, if you're going to vote as a bloc, as a European Union, and not criticize yourselves, but criticize us, why, you know, um, why is that happening? Why is it that you cannot speak? Why can, for instance, France not speak against um, uh, Poland or Hungary or Romania or any other country that infringes European law or actually the standards that are of the OEC, which contain international law standards, commitments, political commitments, but still they, they are there. So I think it raises a lot of very good questions and I think it uh, emphasizes the important role of additional actors or as many actors as possible participating in maintaining what is a live uh, beast. Democracy and rule of law is not static. It's something that will forever be changing. And we need to obviously now come to, we've come to a moment where we need to start backtracking on a lot of these things and using all of the tools that we have to make sure that uh, we can maintain both democracy and rule of law, I would see as, as one whole. So thank you very much for your presentations. I'm going to stop there and ask you, anyone, if you have questions for Carolyn or for Maria to please raise your hands or I'm looking also at the people online. Yes, please. Put on your microphone. Oh. Sorry for maybe it's out of records because it belongs to to the previous section. I just uh, uh, forgot to tell you just one example of how in Hungary interprets the integrity of judges that uh, the courts of Hungary have have had a recommendation that if there is a couple, one judge, one lawyer, and uh, the judge in, or or the lawyer invites friends to their house, the judge should leave that time. For example, for dinner, the judge should leave the, the home, their own home uh, during the visit. And also opposite, if, if a lawyer uh, asks uh, or invites a, a friend of, of maybe another lawyer, the judge should go to cinema or something like that, so should leave. That was an official recommendation. Sorry, I'm really sorry. I know that's not the topic, but that's simply not true. So I'm no. a judge. My husband is a prosecutor. I have several friends among lawyers, court leaders, uh, and uh, and we all come together and enjoy our company. And that's simply not true. I don't know who told you this. Uh, I just ha uh, heard this example, but not not now, but in the in the past. Okay, I can't. Um comment on that, but I can invite uh, others because there has been discussion about, yes, about uh, the role of- uh, Sorry for, for intervening so much. I have a sort of provocative uh, issue for, for Carolyn. And now it is about the standard uh, rule of law and these soft law documents, because we have many soft law documents regarding rule of law. So we have, documents coming from the, the Council of Europe, Consultative Council of European Judges or Venice Commission. Then we have the, uh, the NCJ, the, 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 the body that collects the, the Judicial Council. And, and we have United Nations uh, uh, set of references for standard. And then we have, I would say, look, we don't know clearly what is the standard because we can have the best standard to protect the independence of the judiciary. We have the current standard that normally don't comply with the best. For example, just reading the starting of this document, the uh, Judicial Council elected for the majority of the member by, the, by their peers is an exception in, in the member states. It's the, the best standard, but basically it's not respected by, by, by the member states. So, and, and, and the point is about, uh, let's say, the legitimation of, of the standard, because in this case, as I understand, this is this is, has been prepared by a group of experts, large group of experts, 
and then adopted by uh, the institution. Because, it, for example, I was, I was independent expert for the EU in the negotiations, and I wrote reports about candidate countries that, that then became published and were published in the, in the websites of the, the European Union and the, the local governments. And I never mentioned, for example, the CCJ reports because they don't come from the, from the, the institutions. Uh, only the recommendation issued by the Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe was a, let's say, credible uh, standard in terms of uh, reporting. So um, the, the point is, that which is the legitimation for this document, which is excellent. So I went through and it is the best standard possible, apparently. But then how, how, how to use it uh, uh, concretely in order to, to, to make a change and to impact on, on, the, on the, the, the situation of rule of law uh, disruption in, uh, in the European Union and around? Uh, so thank you very much, first of all, for asking a provocative question. I think these are the most uh, generative type of questions and the most important type of questions to ask. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, I, from my perspective, also uh, being a trained lawyer and educated in international law, I was very, uh, and I, I think I expressed already my hesitance at calling something like this a, a soft law document because I can say uh, this document doesn't have any uh, binding force. And it um, to me, this document is if you find something there which is useful and it helps, then take it and use it. And because this document came out of many questions which we received, we know there are stakeholders who want to hear us say something on these issues. So uh, I really see it as um, not something that uh, I would say, okay, now the field of uh, norm in this area is covered because we as ODIR have spoken on the issue, but rather here is something that we have made a finding on with respect to. And if that finding sheds some further light, for example, on this topic of transfer of judges, if that finding sheds some further light, which may be useful for, for example, civil society who will be monitoring those processes or trying to understand those processes, for academics who are looking at the ways in which others have considered those issues, for uh, some kind of uh, international experts who are looking to understand what are uh, seen by international organizations as being some of the problematic uh, practices which need to be further addressed, then take it and use it. And if, uh, you know, if the country experience is not fully reflected there or if it's not useful, then I would see it not being used, but um, yeah, I think it's something like a um, uh, like an offering which is made, and either it's useful or it's not useful. Uh, but I wouldn't sit here and tell you I feel that this has a binding weight. What I can say is, this was the process we did, and this is what came out of it, and how it will carry forward, I don't know. And I think when we develop key recommendations in 2010. We also didn't understand how it would be carried forward and uh, and the way of that is only for the future really to tell us. Not so much an answer, but maybe more philosophical. Just a small comment. No, no. no. I just wanted to follow up on what Carolyn said, but I'll... No, just to say that um, I would be a little bit more bold than Carolyn because uh, <laughs> with regards to calling this document a soft law document, because um, having worked in the uh, legislative unit and done a number of opinions on Poland, on Hungary, on uh, Romania, together with the Venice Commission, uh, there are many situations in which we call upon uh, our own guidelines, which are not based on just what we think would be nice, 
they're based on experts who come with case law, who come with their national experience, with their national laws. So it's it can be more general because of the fact that it covers such a huge geographical range. But I can, I, I have it somewhere in my computer, I can show you a list of the number of European Court of Human Rights cases that has freedom of Venice Commission on OSC, ODIR, freedom of assembly guidelines mentioned, by paragraph, freedom of association guideline mentioned, political parties guidelines mentioned, um, their own guidelines, of course, mentioned, but number a number of them we have done together. So it's a document that is used as maybe obit a dicta for courts to support their arguments um, um, in favor of however they wish to settle a case. But certainly they, they have appeared, this particular one is too new, but certainly previous ones are done by ODO have appeared. And that's the way we could, I guess, get around having just political commitments um, yeah, and writing legal opinions. That's uh, just a small uh, remark. Um, so Medel always supported the idea uh, that uh, common standards for the independence of the judiciary are necessary in order to have an effective common area of justice, uh, especially for a high council for the judiciary and uh, prosecution uh, service. Uh, since when we talk about uh, prosecution office, we have very... Um, different co national contexts and uh, also the experience in Poland proved that the independence of prosecution office is a um, fundamental aspect of the independence of the whole judiciary. So uh, prosecution office um, <laughs> is the, we can say, it, according to the experience, experience we had in Poland, we have in Poland in, a useful tool in the hand of the executive uh, power uh, ruling party that want to put pressure on, on, on judges. So in, uh, for prosecution office, we have a lot of uh, documents, um, for instance, the declaration of the council, the consultative council of the uh, European uh, prosecutors, stressing that the independence of uh, prosecution services is a, uh, a necessary, necessary corollary of the independence of the judiciary. So the problem is also from the point of view of Medel, how to enforce these common <laughs> standards. So. Um, through recommendation, and then what to do when uh, member states are not in line with the recommendation? And talking <laughs> about the prosecution office, we are not in line with international standards sometimes as mm. well. So yeah, I know. Yeah. Yes, yes. Not just to say that in Italy, for uh, as you know, now we are talking about the reform of the prosecution office that is considered in European context. We can say a model for the, uh, in the internal and external independence of, uh, of, of prosecute, prosecution office and um, a member of the uh, so individual prosecutors. Thank you. Um, I have two hands up online. Yaras and uh, Barbara. Okay, maybe we, we give Barbara the floor first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, hello, everyone. Um, I, I think I have two questions. First, I would start with a question for um, Madam President Giulielni about the role of judicial associations uh, before the Court of Justice. So, as I understand, the natural way to go to Luxembourg, to reach Luxembourg, is to um, initiate a domestic proceedings and then convince the domestic court uh, to refer the case to the Court of Justice. This is the most traditional way, right? For Portuguese judges, Romanian judges, that's how they did it, How that's how they reached um, Luxembourg. The second option was discussed today by you, so that's an attempt to, uh, to check 
and guarantee the standing of individual judicial um, associations, which might seem to be uh, quite a challenge. So if if this case is this case that you mentioned is going to be um, uh, resolved um, by the um, general court, then it might be really a groundbreaking um, a moment in 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 the um, in the case law. But I'm thinking that there is still something missing uh, for the, from the perspective of judicial associations. So we don't have any kind of you know third party interventions. Do you think there are also any changes needed uh, in Luxembourg to first of all to really feel the Luxembourg court is a constitutional court uh, in the in the EU um, um, perspective. Maybe is there something else also missing in, uh, in the picture from the perspective of, you know, important stakeholder, domestic stakeholder who represents um, who represents the judges. I also have the second question. And I think I'm going to share the time with, uh, with Jarosław. But um, in the light of the ongoing debate right now in Poland, uh, my question would go to to Carolyn about uh, about the recommendations. Are there any suggestions about the role of judges in the legislative process, um, not just as 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 a shareholder, a stakeholder, meaning someone who should be consulted, but as someone who proposes a, a draft law, and and the law uh, deals with 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 the courts and with judges themselves. Are there any recommendations or limitations about uh, judges' involvement in the legislative process? Thank you. Uh, so um, the role of a judicial association before the European Court of Justice, yes, this, this is the current situation. And I agree with you, <laughs> maybe, maybe it is necessary to change the rules. Uh, this is a problem not, not only for the uh, judicial associations, but in general for the NGOs. Um, some of them say we need to move from Strasbourg to Luxembourg, <laughs> since the European Court of Justice now is a court of fundamental rights also. The, and, um, but we don't have, uh, we can say, the necessary instrument to do that. So nowadays, the as you as you said, the the, the only um, instrument is to um, I say to support uh, before the national court the request for preliminary uh, ruling, and I know that uh, so this is the case of the action brought before the general court. As I said, is an exceptional step. And, and we need to wait for the, the final decision of the general court with regard to the admissibility of the action. Uh, I know that received positive remarks, the uh, Grand Chamber judgment, uh, it was about the Polish rule of law backsliding uh, on March 2022, since in this uh, judgment, uh, the court, um, recall the main points of uh, a letter of the Polish uh, um, obdu obdusman uh, to the court. So the obdusman was not part in, uh, in, in this case. And uh, the letters described the, the, effect, the effects of the Maso law. Um, and um, so the, the role of the obdusman was to um, give more information about the situation uh, in Poland to the general court, so to the uh, European Court of Justice. So in this decision was um, positively um, uh, commented by the um, academic uh, since the, <laughs> this was considered a sort of um, first step uh, in the direction of Amicus Curia in the Luxembourg uh, court. Um, so I, I think uh, probably uh, so in this context it is necessary to uh, to improve the possibility to um, to take part in the decision as um, uh, third part and on and on as a part in the uh, national uh, uh, court. Uh, the other question was about, um, sorry, okay, this was the question about the, 
the role of judicial the role in the uh, legislative process but i guess caroline could also elaborate on that from the perspective of the recommendations the warsaw recommendations Uh, thank you for the question. I, what I can say about what's inside the Warsaw recommendations is that here we were looking for uh, uh, recommendations which were already broadly supported by practitioners across the region and where we found practical examples of this. I can imagine in the Polish context exactly uh, how your question in the future may apply. But I can say that inside the, the recommendations as they are right now, we don't have something specifically about judges as initiators of a legislative proposal, <laughs> only uh, the right of judges to participate in public discourse on debates that are related to the legislation. Uh, so this is why you will not find them inside the recommendation. This, uh, this recommendation about the participation of the judiciary in processes related to legislation, most recently with respect to Poland, has been made uh, by ODIR in the opinion of uh, January 2023 regarding the most recent uh, legislative proposal. So I think it's actually the last paragraph of, uh, of this January 2023 opinion. What I can say is uh, also that ODIR is uh, regularly convening expert meetings where we're bringing together different stakeholders uh, in uh, Poland, but also in other OSCE participating states upon request of those stakeholders. And these are the type of issues uh, that also may be discussed in the context of those uh, expert meetings. I will give the floor now to Gabor because we are running late on time to wrap up um, the session. You're looking at me funny. <coughs> ah, sorry, Madalina wanted to, uh, sorry. Okay, I take it back. Yaras, you have uh, one minute and a half, oh, my, my 45 question. seconds. To, to, for your question. A question then, was almost um, asked by, by Barbara. I just wanted to add just to show you the, the, the bigger picture. So there is already a draft law on ordinary courts prepared by the Judicial Association Justitia in Poland. So speaking also about, well, but okay, but speaking about uh, checks and balances system and the division of power, there is something for me which is I'm not. I'm not very happy with it. Just, just, just to be honest. So, so that's also the food for thought for you. Like, just from the the moment of the defensive, let's say, strategy and tactics, uh, the judges are also doing the legislation. Well, that that that's all that I wanted to say. <laughs> 